This podcast is brought to you by Most Valuable Podcasts, leading the league in podcasting entertainment. What's up, what's up, everybody? Ricky Widmer here, along with the one, not the only. It's not Brandon Swanson, it's Sean Anderson. Hey, hey, hey. I feel like, you know what I was thinking about doing? What's up? So you know how on the YouTube channel, how we have the about section, Mm -hmm. and it says, like, the podcast that you're under? I think recently... With how much you've been on this podcast, I think we can put the primetime podcast next to you. Just put floater. Like, Fast break, comma floater. I like float. you just, you're on all of them. You've been filling in for the primetime podcast. This is like, what, the third time in almost in two months? Yes, Because you were like on back to back duty mm-hmm. back in the last month. But we got a jam packed show for you guys. Actually, got Matt calling in a little Patreon segment to lead it off. And then we're going to roll right through with our football previews. We got the rest of the SEC, the SEC East. To preview today, actually recording this in advance, so while you guys are seeing this go live, I'm not here. Dave and I are in California. We're at VidCon. We're actually not going to be here in Chicago, so we're pre-recording this one. Before we get into it, before I welcome Matt in, a little housekeeping here at the beginning. A, if you want to be like Matt and be on a podcast, make sure to check out patreon.com backslash most valid podcast. That's where you can support MVP each and every month. Also, go to our store, link down below in the description, where you can get our t-shirt, nice MVP t-shirt, that can be found in the link down below, or at mostvalopodcast.com, where you can also catch MVP each and every day. And then last but not least, go on to Apple Podcasts, go on to iTunes, give the Primetime Podcast and all the podcasts as MVP a five-star rating, and then type in a little something-something about why people should listen to it, what do you like about it, and it would really help us out in the long run, but... We're going to welcome in a patron from, I don't even remember how many months it's been. It's been forever, it seems like. Matt calling in today. Matt, how you doing today? Not too bad. Got through Monday. How about you guys? It one of those days. I got through Monday, applied to a couple jobs, and woke up at 12, so it was pretty great. I, I envy that waking up at 12. I wish I could do that every single day, Sean, so live it up while you can. But Matt calling in today, we're talking a little college basketball, so... Matt, when he sent in the message for us, he's like, you know what? I don't really know what to title it, but basically what we're going to talk about is there were a ton of players that said, hey, I'm going to the draft, and there were some that went to the draft. There's obviously some that came back. So we're going to take a look at the NFL draft returnees, I'm calling them, and we're going to talk about which college basketball teams benefited the most from the players that pulled out and didn't actually go into the NBA draft. We're just going to kind of do it roundtable style. We'll start with Matt, our honored guest. So, Matt, I'll let you go first. Who's one guy, one team you want to start the show off with, talking about who benefited most from the NFL draft returnees? Um, NBA draft. Did I say NFL? I just want to make sure we're talking the same thing. It is NBA. I, I probably do that each and every show. We're talking NBA. Way to go, Ricky. Who is your, for college basketball, who's a team, who's a guy that you're excited is coming back from the NBA draft, not the NFL draft? It's all just, it's all just a jumble up here in my head. Sure. Yeah. So, I mean, shocker, I guess I'll start off with with my team, um, Purdue. So, um, the guy, there was really heading in, there wasn't much concern with Carson Edwards, um, sophomore that made his name known last year and, and was um, awarded the best shooting guard in the nation and was second-team All-American. But um, he did get invited to the Combine. He was a late invite, and he had a pretty good performance from what I heard, such that you know people thought he might sneak in and get taken. So his return is huge for Purdue, having you know four other senior starters that are gone. If, if he would have gone, they, they would have lost all five starters. But instead, they're going to return what, what should be Um, the Big Ten preseason player of the year, and probably uh, a first-team preseason All-American type guy. Yeah, and I know for me, a lot of the guys, and this is kind of taking the Purdue one and kind of blending it in, a lot of these guys are, hey, they were like, for Edwards, looking at the stats, he led the team in scoring. Mm -hmm. So it's like any time you can return your leading scorer from last year, 
you're probably going to do good things the next year with him back on the team. Well, I think the one thing that is massive that Matt did mention is the fact that he's the only starting uh, starter coming back, and that's mm-hmm. that's huge for this Purdue team because Purdue had one of their best years in such a long time. They finally were able to get over that hump. It seems like Purdue, you know, Matt Painter always has some decent seasons in the regular season, and then they hit the NCAA tournament and aren't really able to get over that hump. They hit that hump this year, and Carson Edwards is just having that stability in the starting lineup, and having a scorer, like you mentioned, the leading scorer, Mm -hmm. is going to be so dangerous for this Purdue team, especially if they want to get back to where they reached this year in the NCAA tournament and possibly even reach a Final Four. It's going to be massive for them having Carson Edwards back. No, and I'm going to throw it over to you, Sean, because with Purdue, we'll kind of bring in one of yours because Purdue's not the only team. I'm setting you up for this one. Mm -hmm. Purdue's not the only team that's going to have a big guy coming back. That uh, you know, Edwards sounds like a first, like a first name, last name. The guy you're going to mention, he might have two first names as well. I thought you were just going with the Big Ten connection that these two have. But yeah, my guy's Charles Matthews. Yeah, from Michigan, six six. From Chicago, Illinois, out of St. Rita High School, mm-hmm. Charles Matthews, last year, 13 points. He was a transfer from Kentucky. Uh, he was in the Calipari um, you know, uh, recruitment class um, back in 2015. Played for Beeline. Beeline uh, said that Charles Matthews knew of his intentions when he was hiring, uh, going for the uh, Detroit Pistons job. Matthews is coming back. Beeline coming back. You see what he did in that Michigan team in his sophomore year, technically, um, you look at what he did, 30 minutes per game, 49% from the field, shot 31% from three. Not that great of a free throw shooter, but I think he's going to develop a little bit more, especially when he has mm-hmm. more focus on him in the offense with Mo Wagner leaving. I think it's going to be big for Charles Matthews. He showed a lot as a uh, slashing guard. I think that's going to be big. If he's able to develop that shot a little bit more, get that free throw percentage up to around 65%, it's going to make him more of a dangerous offensive player because he likes to drive to the rim. He's going to get hacked. If he's able to be more efficient there, he's going to be, you know, obviously a leading scorer and a guy that the Michigan Wolverines will go to on offense. But also, if he's able to hit that outside shot just a little bit more, hit about 0.8 per game on 2.6 uh, attempts per game, if he's able to get that up, up to around 34%, not only will make himself look at like a brighter NBA prospect, but he's also going to help himself and the Wolverines get back to glory and possibly a national championship. Well, and the reason why I set you up for it is because I'm going to take that and I'm going to go back to Matthew because this is, I'm glad that Matthew started out with his Purdue connection because this is probably, especially me, I know especially at Matt, this is the conference where it's like, this is the bread and butter. Like I love the Big Ten. Obviously Matt loves as well, his Purdue Boilermakers in the Big Ten. And the thing I look at is both what Purdue and Michigan getting both Edwards and Matthews coming back is, yeah, Edwards led the team in scoring for Purdue and Charles Matthews did not. But you look at Michigan, if they would have lost Matthews, even if uh, Purdue would have lost Edwards, that's the top three point getters from last year on both teams. Mm -hmm. Bye-bye, we're going pro. Then you look at two other teams, one that was the number one team going into the postseason, the other one I believe was number three in the Big Ten, you got teams like Michigan State, Miles Bridges, and I know Jaron Jackson wasn't a top point getter. He was like, what, fifth on the team. But you lose Miles Bridges. That's a big name to lose if you're Michigan State. You got Ohio State also losing guys like Kata Bates Diop. So for me, this either, whether it's Purdue Matt or whether it's Michigan, either one of these two teams can still, with these guys returning, still kind of compete, and maybe one of them, do you think one, either Purdue or Michigan, maybe wins the Big Ten next year because of one of these guys returning? I think it's going to be pretty wide open, to be honest. I think you're you're looking at, I, I saw an article that kind of went over, looked over this, you know, who came back, and especially as it relates to the Big Ten, which had such a down year last year with only four teams making the tournament. They got a lot of good pieces back that should kind of, you know, help them to be a little better as a conference next year. But that said, I don't think there's going to be one runaway team like maybe Michigan State was pegged last year. I think um, that it's going to be pretty competitive. Purdue, Michigan, you know, they're showing up in top 25 rankings. Even Wisconsin, I think they kind of hit their stride at the end of last year. Mm -hmm. And with getting Ethan Happ back, that's obviously huge for them. So um, them, Michigan State, you know, they're going to have talent. So I, I, I don't know. I, I think it, it could, but I think it's only because the conference itself is going to be so wide open. Yeah, and I mean, right now I'm looking at the recruiting rankings from 247sports.com. 
for last year in the conference. And it's like Michigan, Michigan State right there at three, four. It's like, yeah, you've got Purdue at nine and Wisconsin at 13. But the big thing about both of those schools is just because you're not getting a five-star recruiter like for Wisconsin, you're not getting a four-star recruit, doesn't mean you're not bringing in guys and what they're able to work with each and every year. They're not pulling in the Duke-level guys and still competing within their own conference. I'm actually going to go out of the Big Ten for my first guys, and I'm saying guys because there's two of them. And these guys were huge when it came to the NCAA tournament, although they got beat by the Cinderella story, which was our hometown Loyola Ramblers. And that is the, I think they're brothers, Mm -hmm. the Martin brothers from Nevada, um, Caleb and Cody. And it's like these guys ran that team, especially in the NCAA tournament. They're guys where it's like, Caleb was the guy who led the team in scoring. You've got Cody was the guy who led the team in the in the assists. And it's like getting these two back. All right, these are the two that are going to be now leaders on our team yet again this year. This is something that I look at, and I know Nevada, a smaller school from the Mountain West, this is something where Nevada fans can look at it and go, hey, Maybe we can win the Mountain West again and get another tournament bid next year. Well, I think, of course, they can win the Mountain West mm-hmm. again. But I think the biggest thing is now they have this, at least this exposure. And Eric Musselman, a mm-hmm. former NBA coach, was with the Golden State Warriors, was with the uh, Sacramento Kings, really having a resurgence now with Nevada. Now there's going to be more eyes on them. So that's mm-hmm. going to be the biggest thing for Cody and Caleb and this Nevada program is how are you going to deal with eyes on your program? Because you look at what Musselman's been able to do mm-hmm. at his years in Nevada – 24 and 14, 28 and 7, 29 and 8. They're progressively getting better. These two were transfers from North Carolina State, and they have one final year at Nevada. They're gonna have a ton of pressure on them to produce, to 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 you know take Nevada as far as they possibly can. Nevada clearly not a basketball powerhouse, um, in in no really sense. Um, but I, I think the biggest thing for them is just how will they deal with this pressure? And if they do win in the Mountain West, that means they're gonna get a higher seat. They're not gonna be a seventh seed going up mm-hmm. against a Texas team with really only Mo Bamba on the outside and also Roach on the outside, and they're not going to have to deal with a Loyola Chicago. They're not going to have to deal with, you know, the weaker tournament uh, hand they kind of got. Yes, they had to beat a Cincinnati team, but also that Cincinnati team didn't really have a go-to score. They had a great head coach and really a defensive mindset, but they were able to, you know, run back in the second half of most of these games and get victories. If teams are expecting this from Caleb and Cody Martin, especially after a year, I think this is, you know, obviously it's going to help them in the regular season, but once it comes to the tournament, this might end up just hurting the Nevada program that they're coming back because I think Musselman's a great, fantastic coach, but having Caleb and Cody back, the eyes are still going to be on them. The Mm pressure is going to be on them. The expectations are going to be larger for Nevada, and this might end up being a team that, you know, comes in as a five seed, faces one of these terrible 12 seeds, and gets upset and bounces in the first round. I mean, anything can, like, the thing that we've kind of seen is anything can happen in the tournament, but... Also, the thing I look at is, like, look at the Loyola story of, yeah, I would say they're smaller than a Nevada team, but when you get these smaller schools with that veteran presence and with these two being in the tournament before, it'll be a toss-up to see, will the pressure kind of cave them or will it be, hey, we've been here before, we kind of know what to do. Matt, I'm going to come back to you. Who's another guy on your list that you're excited is returning and will benefit his team next year? So to try to keep some connection, it's well. Let's go with another guy from a team that lost to Loyola um, in the NCAA <laughs> tournament, and that's that's Tennessee and Admiral Schofield. So he, you know, this guy's just a monster in in terms of being an athletic freak and just built like no other. So his his return, I think, is huge, especially for a Tennessee team that surprised a lot of people last year um, in the SEC, and. Um, there, you know, it's not just him, Grant Williams. I don't think he necessarily declared, but he um, is another big piece that's back. And you know, you talk about a team making that that step as they did last year, and now having another year to play one another and kind of um, try to take the next step up. And I, I think that his return is going to be huge for them. Well, and before I kind of, because I want to get what you're thinking with this, Sean, I would just want to throw in this. I'm just going to throw a little bit more on that fire because. It's funny that Matt's thinking about Tennessee. I'm thinking about the other surprise from the SEC in Auburn. Like, they're kind of with my Nevada connection, with the SEC connection, they're getting two guys in Heron and Harper coming back where it's like, great, 
we're getting our top two guys back from next year to where I am expecting Schofield back for the Vols, um, Harper and Heron back for the Tigers. No reason why these two teams shouldn't be maybe top two, both top three again next year in the SEC. Yeah, and I think one thing, too, is I'll keep the SEC party going <laughs> because I have two brothers from mm-hmm. uh, the SEC, Quindary Weatherspoon and Nick Weatherspoon of the Mississippi State Bulldogs. The thing that I look at this with the Mississippi State Bulldogs is you're getting two guys that one was uh, all SEC all-freshman year, Nick, mm-hmm. Nick Weatherspoon, and then Quindary was uh, second uh, uh, team uh, SEC. And you look at Ben Holland, his first three years at Mississippi State, 14 and 17, 16 and 16, finally gets over that 500 mark, hits 25 and 12, but isn't able to get to the NCAA tournament. Ben Holland obviously had great success at UCLA, two Final Fours, um, even had two two Sweet 16s with the Pittsburgh Panthers when he was a coach. Hasn't gotten to the tourney yet. Mississippi State hasn't gone to the tourney since 2009. Mm-hmm. It's massive that these two are coming back because you look at what Quindary did. He's a junior. Uh, gonna, well, I think he's going to be a senior because, yeah, he's going to be a senior. Uh, but he, what last year, uh, 14 points per game. 31% from uh, the three, and then 48% from the field. And you look at what Nick was able to do, 6'2 guard, uh, 47% from the field, 29% from three, and eh, 72 from the uh, line, but 10.8 points per game. You're having two guys that know each other, two guys that can score, and you're keeping these two starters around for your team. I think that's massive for Ben Holland's program and massive for the Bulldogs and their fans because if you want to get back to the NCAA tournament, mm-hmm. if Nick went, that would have been a killer. And if Quindary went, that would have been even a, more of a massive blow because he is your best player on this team. I actually want to shoot a question at you, Matt, where we both brought up three SEC teams, but I was waiting for when the SEC came up because there's one guy I was waiting for. I was waiting for one of us to bring up his name, and I know Brandon and I, when he made his decision, we're like, we've got to talk about it, and that's Jonte Porter. This is a team, like not like a Tennessee or an Auburn. They weren't a team that led the conference last year. More of a team like, Sean, like you brought up, with a Mississippi Mm -hmm. State where they were right there. They were only a game better than Mississippi State. The thing I want to ask you, Matt, with Jontae Porter coming back, how much is that going to benefit the Tigers, if any? Does him kind of coming back move the needle and give them any more wins next year? I think it might. I I guess I I struggle with – so Missouri's coach – Conzo Martin is a former Purdue guy, so I've kind of there. There were times when you know Purdue was looking, do we do we ditch Painter and go after Martin? Because Martin, he's he's kind of established this wherever he's been. He's a great recruiter, but for whatever reason, I don't know. He just seems to be stuck in this um, state of I don't want to call it mediocrity, but for the talent he typically has on his teams, um, he just can't seem to get over the edge. So um, that's not to say that. Porter's return won't won't get him there, but I think um, Missouri in general just they need to um, take advantage of the conference they're in. I guess you know, I mean, SEC typically isn't a power conference, and it was admittedly a lot lot better um, last year. But um, yeah, I mean, I'm kind of deviating from the question a little bit, but Porter's return it it's it's big. It's definitely you know it it outweighs not having him. And you kind of knew you were going to lose his brother, but um, I think they just they they if there's going to be a year where they take a step up, it, it it needs to be now before the SEC, you know, some of the top tier teams establish themselves, and then they they get kind of lost in the mix. I completely agree with you, Matt. That the time is now for Mizzou, and I think the biggest thing about Jonte coming back is they lost their two top scorers in Cassius mm-hmm. Robertson and Jordan Barnett. Those two were seniors. Now they've graduated, and you look at Michael Porter Jr. When he was on there, he was technically the third leading scorer because he averaged ten per game in the three games he did play. So you're losing again your top three scorers. Mm-hmm. The fourth scorer, Jonte Porter. So Jonte needs to come in as a leader on this this team, and they still have guys that are still, you know, we're getting minutes. Uh, Kevin Perrier, he's going to be a senior. He averaged 25 minutes per game. Jeremiah Timlin as a freshman, averaged 19.4 a game. Even Jordan Geist, 26.1 minutes per game. He's coming back. So you're still having some some players on there, but having Jonte Porter, a guy who was, we mocked him, at least in the lotto mm-hmm. um, in the NBA, probably would have fell to around the 20s um, if we're being if we're being honest. But he's a guy that is, is is very dynamic. He was able to shoot from the outside as a 6'10 forward. He's not as athletic as his brother, but he is a more physical down low. So I think having him and in the SEC, having a physical guy, we saw this with uh, uh, Yancey um, in, in Georgia, 
Yancey Maton, if we have a, a guy like that who is able to go all the way out down the three-point line and also be physical inside, that's going to be a, a key difference. I think he was SEC player of the year, Yancey Maton was. I don't know if Jonte can do that, but if he's able to put up 15 points, grab about seven boards per game, and even dish out two assists per game to the shooters on the outside like Geist, I think it could be something that you know could really help this Missouri team. And like Matt said, get Conzo over the, over the hump. Well, and I mean, the thing I didn't even think about until after I had asked Matt the question about Jonte is just the SEC in general – has a lot of guys returning. Brings up Schof- Matt brings up Schofield from Tennessee. I brought up the two coming back for Auburn. You brought up the, if I'm not mistaken, two players from Mississippi State. Was mm-hmm. it just one or was it two? Two brothers. Two brothers from Mississippi State. We bring up Jonte Porter. One guy we haven't even mentioned was, this is a guy that was coming back, I believe, before the Combine in Daniel Gafford, because Brandon and I had him in our big board. Mm-hmm. Then he decides, oh, I'm coming back in the comment section. Love to tell us that he's coming back, and it's like, we get it. Um, we did the big board before he made that decision. But that, to me, just all those names, the SEC is going to be very interesting next year to watch. And, I mean, even teams like, I know these aren't ones getting guys back, but like a Georgia team that's now going to have Tom Crean at the helm. What does Alabama do now without Colin Sexton? Like These are teams like the SEC might be one that's really interesting to watch. 2018-2019. Well, it is, it is massive, too, that Gafford's coming back mm-hmm. for Arkansas, too, because they lost Darius Hall, they lost C.J. Jones, and Jalen Barford and Daryl Macon both uh, have all left. Uh, Hall and Jones transferred, and Barford and uh, Macon, Macon have now mm-hmm. graduated. So having Gafford back is massive for the Razorbacks. Well, and just kind of to wrap this one out, we'll go, I have none left. We'll go to Matt. We'll see if he has one left. And then, Sean, if you have one left, your final guys that you want to mention in this segment. Matt, you're up first. Hit it. So I don't necessarily like this team or root for this team, <laughs> but I think <laughs> it's I think o- It's Carolina. okay. I root against Mizzou every time because it's the border war between <laughs> Illinois right. and Mizzou. Fair enough. Yeah, fair <laughs> enough. Um, but uh, I'll go with North Carolina and Luke May, his return. So um, you're talking about, I think, I think he was voted third team All-American maybe last year. So behind Carson Edwards, um, weirdly enough, he I think he's the next best in terms of you know All American status last year. So I would put him as a probably a preseason All American favorite, um, if not first team then second team. But you know what? Talk about a huge stride from um, his 2016-17 season, 5.5 points per game and four rebounds to last year, 17 points per game and 10 rebounds. So. Um, with him, you know, and I guess kind of a formula for North Carolina has been they, they get a lot of the five-star recruits, some of them, you know, leave early, but they always seem to have some, you know, high-contributing guy that's an upperclassman, and I think Luke May is going to fit that bill. Like Joel Berry last year. Or was Theo, the Theo Pinson as well. Mm-hmm. So, I mean, they lost two guys like Theo Pinson and Joel Berry, like Matt just mentioned, two upperclassmen that contribute, and now you're losing those two guys. You need some leadership on that Roy Williams team, and and like you know Matt mentioned, Luke May is a perfect guy, and that jump, a guy that can you know is that big and shoot forty two percent from three, it's absolutely deadly. So if, if he needs to take a, a couple more jumps. I don't think he's consistent enough, but if he's consistent enough, he's a deadly player. He was always that guy, like when he when. All the news was coming out about who's declaring for the draft. When his was like, oh, I'm declaring without an agent. Like, first when I saw he's declaring, I looked like, re- like no disrespect, but I'm like, really? Like, really? You're declaring for the, like, do you think you're going to get drafted? Because I don't think you'd get drafted. Mm-hmm. Um, and then he was always a guy I pegged of like, we'll see. Oh, he didn't sign with an agent. He's coming back. He just wants to go through the process and come back. I think he's smaller, less athletic Kevin Love, but even in <laughs> college when you're, you know, your fourth year mm-hmm. senior with his abilities, he's still a good basketball player. I still think he's going to be uh, uh, a guy to watch out for. And the final guy I want to throw out there, final two guys, um, mm-hmm. sticking with the ACC, it's uh, Syracuse, O'Shea Brissett, and Tyus Battle. We looked at what this team did as an 11 seed. Mm-hmm. Them two coming back, it's going to be massive. Tyus Battle was uh, their leading scorer last year, 19.2 points per game. O'Shea, O'Shea Brissett, a uh, bigger forward down low. He's a guy that averaged 14.9 as a freshman. Massive that those two are coming back. Jim Behan has to be at least moving up in the ACC. I know they were a little bit lower, a little bit of a, a kind of a slight, like why were they in the NCAA tournament last mm-hmm. year? But with these two guys coming back, having another year, having the ter- experience in the tournament, 
this is a team that maybe six Sweet 16 Elite Eight should be on the docket uh, and expectations for the Syracuse Orange. They are always a team that is like, for Syracuse, like it just seems like they're always a team that is on the bubble and then either people are mad that they didn't get in or people are mad that they did Mm -hmm. get in. And this year, it'll be interesting to see how the ACC kind of ends up, because let's be honest, we're all assuming Duke is healthy and they're going to run away with it. And I don't think they're on the bubble this year. I think they might be closer Mm -hmm. to that 6 to 10 range for the the Syracuse Orange. Well, this is where you guys come in. Let us know what you guys think down below. I want to thank Matt for joining us for another great Patreon segment. If you want to be like Matt, go check out our Patreon link down below. In the comment or in the description, then let us know what you guys think down below in that comment section. Let's move on though, Sean, into the real, like kind of like how you said for the fast break, the real deal, the main reason for the podcast this week, continuing our previews through college football. And we're finishing out the SEC, and you roll your eyes a little bit there. It's I like, a long one. I like college basketball better. It is. It's so that's, that's why I'm, I'm rolling my eyes. Sean's like, I, 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 I like having go back to college football. I like having Matt on. I like talking about college basketball. We're in the NBA draft season. That's all. I'm not, I'm not bashing on SEC football. No. Sooner rather than later, we'll be doing our college basketball previews during the football season. That will be fun. But what we're doing is we're going through every single SEC team. Last week, Brandon and I went through the West. This week, we're going through the East. How we start is we start with the bottom, we move all the way to the top, and then at the end, we kind of end up the show. So we will look at first the Tennessee Volunteers as a team, 0-8 last year, or Mm -hmm. 0-8 in conference, 4-8 overall. Butch Jones, adios, you're out of here. You can't win a game. You don't deserve to be here. So that's where I want to ask you this. I know a month ago, Brandon and I talked about comments that new head coach Jeremy Pruitt had made after it's not John Gruden, it's not John Gruden. Oh, okay. it, it was going to be John Gruden, but okay. it's not John. Gruden. I thought Lane Kiffin was coming back. It was going to be Lane Kiffin oh, also. Okay. It was right. also going to be Greg Schiano too. Dang! But Jeremy Pruitt is the guy coming mm-hmm. over from Alabama. So here's the question I want to ask about about Pruitt: Is what do you expect from him year one? Because the question that Brandon and I talked about was, can he turn this team around because of the attitude? It seems he's already trying to put in place. In Knoxville. It's going to be tough to see if he can turn it around just because we don't know what he can do as a head coach. But mm-hmm. you look at his resume. I mean, he's been you know involved in college football since 1997. I mean, you look at what he's done recently, and, and really the thing that sticks out to me, you know, you have powerhouses and then you have Hoover High School. And when you're the defensive back coach for Hoover High School in 2004, oh. nothing beats that. <laughs> um, but no, I mean, consistently being in the SEC since 2014, Georgia, uh, he was D.C. and DB, DB coach, and then Alabama um, recently as the DC and then inside linebacker coach. I mean, there's there's an expectation that this defense for the Vols, it was so bad last year, mm-hmm. they couldn't stop the run, gave up over, I think, 33 points per game, can now at least make that shift to look like a competent um, SEC defense. Because the biggest thing with SEC football, it, it's smart, it's fast, it's strong, and it, you have to have a great defense if you want to win. You know, I mean, you can give up 30 points and mm-hmm. still win, but technically or and typically, you're grinding out these games. You're trying to keep that the, the, the defense um, of the other team off the field. You want to waste time. You want to waste that clock and keep your offense fresh and try to tire out that defense. And I think that's the biggest thing for Jeremy Pruitt is just revamping this defense. If he's able to revamp this defense, get them to around like 26 points per game, bring down that rushing defense uh, and, 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 you know, slow down the uh, rushing offense uh, for the opposing team, I think that's going to be the biggest thing for pr- thing, thing for Pruitt. I don't really have a win marker. Mm-hmm. If they get to six, five, six or five wins, I think that's going to be a success for Pruitt. But as long as the defense sees a step up, I think at least the Tennessee Vols will be in the right direction because well, he still needs to get his own recruiting class in. I'm, I mean, for me, there's two big, like, looking at the offense, because that's usually what I look at first, is really with Pruitt, what you said defensively, being a defensive coach, Obviously, it's you want that to be your bread and you want mm-hmm. that to be really well because it's your bread and butter. But to me, there's two big questions for this team, and they're both on the offensive side. The first, I'll go with the smaller of the questions, is when you look at Pruitt and what he envisions for this offense, it's really a ground and pound where we're going to run the ball, we're going to smash you in the mouth with the run game, kind of like how Alabama does it, where I kind of, in a couple years, envision Pruitt building Tennessee in the image of Alabama where it's just running backs coming in left and right and it's like oh one left it doesn't matter because we got these other three or four 
that are right here that you know their name. And for this year, it's a little bit different for Tennessee because John Kelly left. He was their leading rusher. He left the university because he just didn't want to be there anymore. So now the main guy up is Ty Chandler. He's the guy, only had 71 carries last year, just over 300 yards. He's your main guy right now. But on top of that, the bigger question, what are you going to do at quarterback? Because you've got two guys that have been there. You've got Will McBride. You've got Jared um, Garantano who have been there. However, you've got an incoming freshman coming in, JT Shroud. You also have a graduate transfer from Stanford who is Mm -hmm. uh, pretty respectable from Stanford in Keller Christ, who he was 11-2 as a starter in the pro-style offense for Stanford, I want to ask you, because for Ty Chandler, it's really, can he produce with a bigger role? Because he's probably going to, obviously going to get more carries. Can that equal more yards for him? The biggest question is, what do they do at quarterback? Because I'm assuming it's Keller Christ, but you're not just going to hand him the job. He's going to have to earn it. I think it's going to be Christ, just because you look at, him having experience, and I think that's the mm-hmm. biggest thing for a new program is having an experienced quarterback. If you're throwing in a freshman quarterback with questions behind, you know, at, at the line, at the offense, what it's going to look like, having a guy who's just been in situations, been in big moments, has gone against, you know, teams like USC, gone against, uh, you know, Notre Dame. Um, when he has the experience against those teams, against big programs, I think that's going to be the biggest thing um, for at least a new program. And he, he wasn't great, let's be honest. Kevin mm-hmm. Christ wasn't a great quarterback last year. Um, 54.2% completion percentage, 8-4 to four touchdown to interception ratio, but he is going to manage the game at least. And I think that's going to be the biggest thing is he doesn't need to be spectacular, and usually, typically, SEC quarterbacks aren't. I mean, let's look at how many SEC quarterbacks have really exploded mm-hmm. to be great NFL pros. The only one I could think of recently is Cam Newton, and Cam Newton's a, mm-hmm. a next-level athlete. I mean, we consistently look at guys um, – in the SEC as game managers, the guys who can at least you know throw the ball 10 yards and try Your to get A.J. McCarron-type yeah. players. A.J. McCarron, uh, Danny Etling, th- those type mm-hmm. of, uh, of players. Um, I-, I think that's going to be the biggest thing. You know, Obviously, Georgia had a, a different level, but even then, um, you look at Alabama, like they don't have a great quarterback that's going to turn to a great know. NFL pro. Tua, Tua might be that guy. Outside, outside but it's one, it's I one know. game. We've only seen one half, um, not even a game. But I mean, you look at Jalen Hurts. <laughs> I mean, Jalen Hurts usually typically mm-hmm. did enough. I think the only thing for Christ is that he needs to do enough. Mm-hmm. Um, and especially to start off the season. If he's not doing enough, you can take him out. But for the first couple of games, I think that's the biggest thing for, for this Tennessee team is just get them used to the style that Pruitt wants them to play get them used to having a guy that knows how to deal with high pressure situations I think that's the biggest thing is Christ will be able to step in and has experience has a great experience against uh, under David Shaw has great experience mm-hmm. with Christ Love before um, so I think the biggest thing is just having a guy that can step in there and be cool calm and collected and I think that's gonna be Christ well and that's why for me when because I'm looking at this going Christ is gonna be the guy because I don't think he's gonna be the guy for the whole season you he's not don't that think good. so? No, I don't. I, I don't think he's that good. Um, I, I the think, only reason I think he will is because I don't think any of the guys below him. Like I don't think that Trout's going to get much of a chance because freshman coming in, I feel like he'll just be pushed to the bottom. I think it's going to be if I'm going with the depth chart, I'd go with um, Christ to start. Garantano will be two. McBride will be three. Shroud will be four. If Shroud moves up, he's then he'll move up to three. But like I look at Jared Garantano and it's like this is a guy that yeah almost threw for a thousand yards last year. Yeah, he completed about sixty two percent of his passes. But he was a guy that was like four touchdowns, two high. And like there was nothing special mm-hmm. about him. He didn't have an it factor. Whereas with Kellen, or Keller Christ, mm-hmm. the thing that I think is more important is, yeah, he wasn't good last year. But look at his 2016 year. And you might be saying, Ricky, that was two years ago. And the guy got benched in 2017. Well, and it's not, it's not that like, okay. So 2017 he got benched. But 2016 is what I'm looking at. The reason why is that Stanford team was a lot more stacked than it was in 2017. So for Tennessee, it's more of if you want the quarterback to do it all, which I'm assuming Pruitt does not, Mm -hmm. then Christ might not be your guy. But if you can elevate a Ty Chandler, much like, because that 2016 year, I'm not saying Ty Chandler is going to be like this, but Mm -hmm. Keller Christ had Christian McCaffrey and Bryce Love in that backfield. So I'm not saying you're going to have that at Tennessee, 
But if you can elevate some talent to help out, he might have a I, pretty good year. I think it may be, maybe not three games or two games, but mm-hmm. I think Christ will most likely play against non-conference opponents, so mm-hmm. West Virginia, ETSU, um, UTEP. And then once we hit probably that Georgia game, after they lose to Florida and Georgia, because that's what I expect, um, I think that they're going to look for a change of quarterback. And so you're think, saying at Auburn? Yeah, at Auburn, that's where Christ is most likely going to get benched. Because, um, again, I don't think he's that great enough a quarterback. I think mm-hmm. he's going to be a guy that just needs to get some stability right away into the program. I don't think he's going to be the guy that starts up. And I think you got to look at Will McBride. He's a guy that was a three-star recruit um, coming out of high school, and he's a guy that's a dual-threat quarterback. And I think he's a guy that's going to be something interesting. And if mm-hmm. you're able to throw him in different sets and he's able to do enough with his arm, he's Got some nice speed, was able to rush for a couple yards last year. I think that he can be a guy that, again, he might not be the greatest quarterback, but again, we've seen this before in the SEC work, like Jalen Hurts. If you're quick enough, if you're dynamic enough, if you're able to pick up first downs, that's going to be the biggest thing. Will McBride might be able to do that for this Tennessee team. I think he's going to offer more in that area than Christ offers overall. So I think I think maybe Will McBride is a guy that also makes a name for himself because, yes, you look at... Um, Obviously, what, uh, what what Tennessee was able to do last year and, and Garantano was able to do last year, mm-hmm. um, but but I think McBride, being a freshman last year, now getting an, a second year in, as a sophomore, they might look at him, especially if he's able to do some damage in some different sets, especially early on in the games against UTEP and, and ETSU. Well, and one of the last things I want to mention about the offense is, no matter what quarterback is out there, the biggest thing coming back this season will be um, Jawan Jennings coming back, because... In 2016, huge Hail Mary catch against Georgia. Everyone remembers that, especially if you're in Knoxville. But last year, you might not remember Jennings if you're not a Tennessee fan because he was injured. He suffered a season-ending wrist injury last year. Didn't see him for every other game after that injury. So to me, it's will Jennings come back and be the main guy? I'm assuming he'll come back be the main guy, and can these other wide receivers like Callaway and Johnson fill in and be kind of a competent receiving core for whether it's Garantano, whether it's a Keller Christ, whether it's a Shrout, if the freshman ever starts any games this year. Yeah, I think the biggest thing, though, again, is going back to this defense, because mm-hmm. that's where this is going to shine. And this, is where, this is where Pruitt's going to need to make his name mm-hmm. again. He, if, if the offense sucks, the offense sucks. He hasn't been able to bring any recruits in. He hasn't been able to talk anybody uh, to, to anybody yet. He hasn't been able to bring in his own guys. I'm not too worried about mm-hmm. that, to be honest with you. Um, I, I'm looking at this defense, though, because, again, he's been given talent before. He's been given talent at Georgia. He's been given talent at Alabama. Now he's got to take the talent that he has at Tennessee mm-hmm. and put this into a defense that isn't, you know, full of pa- pa- you know holes like like, mm-hmm. like paper can be. Um, I, I think <laughs> the biggest thing is it's going to be at least um, having – a pretty decent secretary, having a playmaker that linebacking core, which he does have um, this year um, in, in Darian Kirkland. I think the thing for Pruitt is as long as he's able to at least put out a, a very decent defense, uh, a respectable defense, I think that's going to be the biggest win for the Vols this season because I think they can beat ETSU. Mm-hmm. I think they can beat UTEP. Um, so there's two wins right there. Now you need to just find four more mm-hmm. in that schedule to end up at that six win mark, which I think would be a, a healthy start for Jeremy Pruitt because I don't think this is going to be a nine team team like mm-hmm. you know, Butch Jones was able to get a couple of years ago. I don't think this is going to be national championship winners like uh, you know uh, they were able to get out of Peyton Manning. But I think this could be a, a team that at least gets you know a fairly decent amount of wins. And, and Pruitt, if he's able to put out a decent defense, can get those six wins. Well, it'll be interesting. I'll throw in one more, and it's kind of masked because it's later in the year. I think they can beat Charlotte too. So it's three wins. Mm-hmm. You got Charlotte, yeah. Eastern Tennessee, and UTEP. The only question for me is: Do they win an SEC game this year? Do they beat? West Virginia on a neutral site. And with the defense, the thing I'm looking at, the thing I feel like is going to be the best this year for them is their front defensive line. Because although Pruitt moving over to a 3-4, it's going to be interesting. Because like, oh, if they were in their 4-3, you would have um, Tuttle and Johnson in the middle. And then you would have Phillips and Kongbo on the outside, which I believe Tennessee fans, correct me if I'm wrong, I believe Kongbo is moving to the outside. Like, he was originally an interior defensive lineman. Now he's moving to the outside. The thing that I think will be interesting there is you have four guys, you move to three guys, and really that middle position of will it be better rather than having all four of them out there at once, rotating that middle to where the nose tackle in this is always the freshest guy and they're just kind of 
rotating Johnson and Tuttle out there. So mm-hmm. that to me is going to be the crucial thing because the are the most crucial thing Crucious. because the thing that you'll have to do. What are you going up against with this division? You've got quarterbacks, quarterbacks, and quarterbacks. From you've got um, Felipe Franks will probably be the guy in Florida. Stidham, Tua. You've got quarterbacks in this division, especially mm-hmm. in that four game stretch. How do you get them? Fluster them. Get after that quarterback. Well, and I think one thing too is I think you're right about the at least the rotating in, mm-hmm. uh, you know, the the, the fresh in, in the in the middle of the three four because we saw that a lot at, at, at Alabama. I think Pro's going to bring that over. Um, but it's really how how talented are these guys enough to do that? How quickly are they going to pick this up? Um, so maybe so I think that's the best part about the schedule for them is that they're starting off against West Virginia, where if they lose it, no one's really going to be too shocked mm-hmm. because West Virginia consistently puts out a decent program. Um, but I think the, the one thing is then you have two easy games against ETSU and UTEP, um, and then you have a, you know pretty much a, a schedule from hell with Florida, Georgia, Auburn, Alabama right there. Then you get South Carolina a little bit more of a break, but that's still on the road. But then those last four games is where you're really going to need to shine because that's late in the season. That's mm-hmm. when these guys have been in practice just been in the film room. They've gone through the tough part of the season, and now you get Charlotte, now you get Kentucky, now you get Missouri, and now you get Vanderbilt. These teams are okay, but nothing great. And I think that's yeah. the biggest thing for um, this team uh, in, in, uh, in, in, in Tennessee is you're not going up against great quarterbacks outside of Drew Locke in that Missouri game. Mm-hmm. You have the chance to possibly take all four of those games if you're able to take you know, three, uh, the three, three of the four non-conference games in you know, ETSU, UTEP, Charlotte, you get a seven-win se- seven season, you're going to a bowl, and mm-hmm. this is a very successful season for, for Jeremy Pruitt. Well, and the thing that, the last thing we'll kind of do to close this up before we go into the next team is right at the end of, I'm looking at the Athlon Sports preview for Tennessee, and they're saying that, and here's the quote, Pruitt hopes that recipe is good, enough to produce at least six wins in year one. I look at that, and I know he had four last year, but I look at that goose egg in the conference, and at first sight I go, all right, maybe you're being a little bit too ambitious with six wins. But the more I think about it, we mentioned it. Eastern Tennessee, UTEP, Charlotte, those should be three wins. And the thing that will be interesting is, yeah, you almost beat Florida last year. It was a six-point game. Mm -hmm. However, that was – a different Florida team. That was Dan, at Florida, though. And it was at Florida, but Dan Mullen being the head coach, I yeah, expect yeah. Florida to have a different attitude around him. Also, well, so you could say the same thing for Jeremy Pruitt. And well, and that's what I'm too. saying. That's the end of the season. Yeah. More so, Mizzou, who's going to be at home, and Vanderbilt, because those were two games you got blown out. 50-17, to 42-24. But let's be honest. Butch Jones wasn't boosting well, these guys gone. with confidence. I think it was gone at that point, too. Exactly. So, I mean, this they team, had no coach. They this, didn't care. This team, exactly what you said, did not care. I expect that to change this year, so those two games might be different. The third thing that I think needs to stay the same that it was last year, you came out game one last year, played a Georgia Tech team, a Power 5 team on a neutral site, punched them in the throat, won 42-41 to 41 in double overtime. You need to get a win like that week one. You mm-hmm. need to set – I'm not saying they will. I'm saying you need to set, set the statement week one and get a surprise on West Virginia if you want to set yourself up for a six-win season because then the only way you're getting to six wins this year, in my mind, is if you go 4-0 in non-conference, beat Mizzou, beat Vandy. I think they can beat Kentucky. I think they you can think beat so? Kentucky. I think they can beat Mizzou. I think they could beat Vandy. They can go three and four. Mm-hmm. And they can get six wins. Um, and maybe even South Carolina turns up to be an upset. I mean, I know that is in Columbia, mm-hmm. but I still think that could possibly be a win because especially if you're coming off those two massive games, mm-hmm. um, especially the Alabama game, and you finally get to go up against South Carolina, it's kind of like taking the donut donut off a ba- uh, baseball bat, yeah. it's going to be a little bit lighter. It's going to be a little bit mm-hmm. easier. Um, so if you're able to go in there with some confidence, especially if that Alabama game's like close, mm-hmm. you know, if you are if you lose by 10, I think that could possibly be a, a moral victory for this Tennessee team. And you go into South Carolina, you possibly get a win. I see possibly eight wins for this Tennessee team. I'm going to mm-hmm. pick five because I don't believe in them too much. I mm-hmm. think that they're going to struggle out of the gates. Um, I think the tough games, especially to start off the SEC conference, um, is going to be is going to be bad. But I think the biggest thing is not really the wins again for Jeremy Pruitt. It's how this defense looks under Pruitt. And the one thing that I do wonder, I have to, look, I, I need to fact check myself before I go ahead and say it. I wonder if this could be a situation like we saw in Georgia, where 
year one, pretty good season. We went like maybe three, four wins in conference, got about six to eight wins, maybe more on the six side for Tennessee. And then the next year rolls around with my recruits. Boom, we just shock everyone. I'm not saying national championship shock because I don't think many people expected that from Georgia last year. But I wouldn't be surprised if next year Georgia or not Georgia, Tennessee is yet again in the discussion of wow, these are this is a team to watch to maybe be competitive I in their side of the conference. I think it'll okay, take like two years before they're okay. like you know near the top top mm-hmm. end of the SEC East because again we're looking at you know a, a loaded SEC yep. East um, again again these teams are going to get better like Georgia, mm-hmm. Florida's going to get better under Dan Mullen. Um, so I think these are teams that you got to watch out for. I think Tennessee, especially once Pruitt gets his um, recruiting classes in, I think, you know, probably two years, that's when we're going to look when these guys are sophomores and these guys are fully invested into the Pruitt system. But I, I think, you know, Tennessee Vols fans should be excited. I know Pruitt wasn't a mm-hmm. sexy hire like Lane Kiffin if he came back or like a John Gruden, well, but I think Jerry Greg Pruitt Schiano is a guy. Greg Schiano was hired yeah. and they pushed but, him out. But I, th- I think especially with, um, with uh, Jerry Pruitt now, I think this is a guy that, again, has a lot of a lot on his resume and even though he hasn't had that fully uh mm-hmm. you know that head coach experience being a part of uh, that Alabama system and being the DC and being a part of that Georgia system and being the DC is, is absolutely massive and it's pretty much like a head coaching job in itself. And I know the true reason why Val fans didn't want Shiano there but I guess the one of the other reasons was they just didn't want to see any Shiano men in Knoxville for Greg Shiano to turn those Vols into. But if you're a Tennessee fan, let us know what you guys think down below in the comment section. What should we expect from your team on offense, defense? What do you think schedule-wise, win-losses? What are you expecting for this Tennessee team in year one of Jeremy Pruitt? Let us know what you think down below in the comment section. Let's move on, though, Sean, into the next team, looking at the Vanderbilt Commodores. And one thing that I know for Vanderbilt fans is they're probably wishing that their football team was as good as their baseball team because the baseball team really good football team hasn't been as good last year. Only There's winning some smart folk at Vanderbilt. Too. Only winning one, one conference game last year, and you know, uh, former great Chicago Bear went to Vanderbilt. Uh, Jay Cutler. Jay Cutler went to Vanderbilt, but oh. what we're looking at, and the reason why I bring up Jay Cutler is first thing I want to look at is the quarterback mm-hmm. for the Commodores. This is a guy coming in senior Kyle Shermer last year. 2,800 yards, just over that. A completion percentage of 58%, not the best, not the worst. However, he was a guy, 26 touchdowns, 10 INTs. Is he going to be enough to help this team win some more games this year? Because, yeah, they won five games, but that's because they went 4-0 in their non-conference game. I think he can be, you know, something that's going to be a bright light for for Vanderbilt. And the one thing too is yes, this Vanderbilt team had a rough end of the season, mm-hmm. 1 and 8 in the SEC like you mentioned, but I think the thing with Shermer is you got to look at this defense and this defense kept him kept him on the field pretty much. They kept mm-hmm. pushing this team out because they couldn't stop anybody. So now Shermer, he's going to have less pressure on him hopefully if Kyle Tarver the new uh DC is going to be able to do his job correctly and if they're able to at least start stopping some guys I think Kyle Shermer, especially you know having another year under his belt, can maybe get that comp- completion percentage up to sixty percent, throw for three thousand yards, and keep that touchdown percentage around mm-hmm. you know twenty six to ten. I think this team again, maybe they won't be great, maybe they won't be winning the SEC, maybe they won't have like a, a meteoric rise like uh, Georgia did last year, um, where no one really expected them to win the national championship championship outside of Georgia fans, but. I think the big thing with Vanderbilt is they're going to have a guy who is conditioned, a guy who's been playing um, in the uh, in, sorry in the NCAA um, about 25 games in his career now mm-hmm. um, as a starter. He's a guy that I, I look at, and I think that he is a, a bright light for Vandy, and I think he could be something special and and possibly you know be in the son of Pat, and maybe make himself a, a, a pro. Um, prospect if he has a really good season. I think having him back is, is something great because you're going to be changing a lot on this defense. Mm-hmm. Having stability on that offense is going to be huge for Vandy. Well, and he's the bright light. And the reason why I bring up Jay Cutler is last year, the Commodores ranked fourth in the league with 243.6 passing yards per game. Their highest total since Jay Cutler's senior year in 2005. Ew. And he also ended their four-year streak of where the team threw more INTs than touchdowns. So that's a good one. That's he a good ended one. two yeah. stroll that streak yeah, and then had the you, highest. You guys are throwing more interceptions than touchdowns. Also, the thing that's going to help him, I think you mentioned it a little bit, but they return all five starters. 
on the offensive line. Mm-hmm. The to me, the big question offensively, and yes, defense is the question because the more you, the quicker you let the other team score, you're putting your offense right out there without getting any rest. You got to keep that other offense out on the field. It's kind of like a little mix and match game of like we don't want the defense out there too long, but we don't want them to score like that. And then our offense is back out there playing with the deficit. To me, the most crucial guy on offense is going to be, I didn't think I would be talking about a former fighting Illini on this podcast, but I am in Kashawn Vaughn, where he was a guy where I was excited to see him 2015 because he was a guy that added some good attempts, good minutes for us in Champaign. Lovey Smith's staff comes in. He loses favor with Lovey's staff. Says, screw it, I want out of Illinois. It might have been Lovey's staff. Actually, it might have been Bill Cubitt's staff, if I think about it. One of those two staffs he falls out of favor with, wants out. Coming back home to Nashville, he to me is, can he kind of take over this run game for Vanderbilt? Because last year, it's like, yeah, you're going to re- you're gonna return Ralph Webb, who is the all-time leading rusher for Vanderbilt the last three years. However... This is a team that ranked last in the SEC with 107 rushing yards per game. That's because they were on the field. So Because exa- they had to throw the damn ball because they couldn't stop anyone on defense. I mean, a little bit tomato, tomato, but that's not good. When it's like, yeah, we're returning our leading rusher, but we're only averaging this many rushing I mean, yards. Vanderbilt, a game. even though it's leading rusher, it's like mm-hmm. being like the you know the highest scorer at you know like a a, a grammar at school Hoover. with five kids. At Hoover High School. No, it's it's like it's like you know you're, you're, being the leading rusher mm-hmm. at, at Vanderbilt isn't that impressive because yeah. they they don't they, they're not that good of a football program. Mm-hmm. So I mean it's it's not that impressive. It's like being the valedictorian again at like you know a. Yeah. a, a School with five five kids. Mm-hmm. Um, I think the biggest thing again for this offense is just making sure that you're able to be balanced and, mm-hmm. and like you mentioned, having the least amount of, uh, of rushing yards. It, it's it was something that obviously was you know obviously uh, disconcerting, um, but. With this Vandy offense, you're going to be able to take pressure off with Shermer, and then just like you mentioned, if coming in, Sean Vaughn is able to at least get through the hashes, get maybe a hundred yards per game, have maybe a thousand yard rushing season. And Shermer throws for a thousand yards. This could be a Vanderbilt team that maybe mm-hmm. gets you know three, four wins, which is a significant improvement over that one. And you got to look at what was working last year to start this season. Yes, they were playing at least you know worse opponents in, in, in the start of that season. But the they, defense was stout. Four, four, four and zero. Oh. Yeah, but I mean you're also going up against you know yeah. bad opponents is what I was trying to say. Um, so I think if it, the big thing though, at least offensively, when you look at what they were able to do last year, they were able to be balanced in those wins. And I think that's going to be the biggest thing for them is just staying balanced and being able to at least take pressure off Shermer, take pressure off that defense, and and be able to at least change the pace on Mm -hmm. on teams. For me, I look at it, and I'm looking at their schedule now, and really with the defense, because like you said, yeah, you probably didn't play the best opponents in those three games, but it's very, like, fans are going to look at, maybe not fans, but maybe just the national fan of football is going to look at, wow, what was going on with your team that in the first three games— you had the nation's best total defense in 198.3 yards per game and the nation's best scoring defense where you were only giving up 4.3 points per game and you were 3-0. and Now, I know what you said. You're not playing the best opponents. Last year, if I pull up their Alabama, schedule, A&M, Middle, Middle Tennessee State, and they did play Kansas State. But Kansas State, not a, not a slouch, but no. it, not maybe... Now, like this schedule, I think they're out of conference. You might disagree. I don't know. But mid-Tennessee State, Nevada, those should be winnable games. To me, the question is going in, like non-conference-wise, going into South Bend to play the Notre Dame Fighting Irish. Is that a step up from Kansas State? Is it a step down from Kansas State? I really don't know because of maybe I'm only saying that because of everything that's been said about Brian Kelly and this coaching staff and kind of some of the national 
I don't want to say bias, but national stories around Notre Dame. I want to say it's a step up in competition. It's a massive than step up. Kansas State. It's a massive step up. I, I want to give respect to Kansas State because I mean, mm-hmm. you look at their, you look at Bill Snyder. I mean, that guy's been there literally since like the, the prehistoric mm-hmm. ages. Um, but Notre Dame's a step up. I mean, you're going from Kansas State, who is you know middle of the pack of the Big Twelve, to Notre Dame, who is a nationally recognized brand. And these are guys that are bringing in mm-hmm. five four star recruits. You're still going to have Brandon Wimbush there, but there, he might not even be the starter. But he's still going to be able to bring uh you know a change of pace you're losing uh, uh your, your star back in uh, I'm, I'm blanking on his name now because we're not we haven't been talking about him uh star back last year uh for Notre Dame but it, it's a massive step up because Brian Kelly yes he's made mistakes mm-hmm. but you're also under the microscope of being a national yeah. team he had a program last year that was phenomenal I mean mm-hmm. I mean this team exceeded expectations they you know stumbled near the end but I still look at Notre Dame as a team that's going to give Vanderbilt trouble and it, it's going to be massive trouble I think in my mind of, of going and, and taking on uh, Notre Dame well and for me moving past that is really the big question of where I feel like this team can go three and one kind of like what we said with Tennessee can go three and one in the non-conference I can see them beating mid-10 mm-hmm. I could see them beating Nevada I can see them beating Tennessee State now Florida Georgia sorry losses South Carolina, I'd put a question mark by. We're going to get into them later, but they're a team where I don't know if they're going to be second in the SEC yet again this year like they were last year. Every game from October 20th to the end of the year, I could see I could see Vanderbilt winning that game. Will they win them all? No, probably not. But every single game from from Kentucky all the way down to Tennessee, I think they've got a puncher's chance in those games, especially if the defense can do enough to help the offense, which kind of seems like it's going to be the more stacked side of the ball yet again this year when we get to SEC play. Yeah, I, I, don't, I don't know about puncher's chance, but I don't think it would be as bad as last year. I don't think it's going to be 58 to nothing mm-hmm. against Alabama or, or anything like that. But again, like like you said, I think you know Middle Tennessee, Vanderbilt, uh, Nevada, Vanderbilt, those two will be wins for the Commodores. I think they might get rolled by Notre Dame, especially Notre Dame having three straight home games to start the year. Mm-hmm. Ian Book being the starter. Um, you know, I, I still believe highly in Notre Dame. I think they're going to get absolutely rolled. Um, but, you know, going up against South Carolina, like you mentioned, Tennessee State, um, uh, I think those are, are puncher chances. Kentucky as well, that being a, a rivalry game, that's going to be a puncher's chance. But I, I think when we look at, you know, the games against Florida, the games against Georgia, um, I think those two are going to be absolute blowouts. But like you mentioned, I think maybe a puncher's chance against Vanderbilt, puncher's chance against Mississippi, and puncher's mm-hmm. chance against Tennessee. Um, maybe even more of a puncher's chance than against Tennessee, especially what they did um, to them last year. But I think overall, this Vanderbilt team is going to be in games. I don't think it's going to be blowouts like it was last year. Mm-hmm. But I still look at the Vols maybe getting four SEC wins, three SEC wins. Well, and the three that I look at within those last five games, Arkansas, Old Miss, Tennessee, because they all have one thing in common. Old Miss fans are going to tell me that they don't fall into this category, but technically you do because last year the coach was an interim coach. They all have brand new head coaches. Mm-hmm. And I know, like I said, Old Miss fans are going to say, no, we have the same coach that we had last year. He was an interim last year. This is his this first, first year as the head coach. Yeah. So, I mean, and technically I think last year was a full season. It was the whole um, Hugh Freeze, Hugh Freeze um, debacle that was going on. They didn't know if they were going to hire him full term. But that to me is with Old Miss being the question mark, you've got Jeremy Pruitt. We just talked about him trying to implement his system at Tennessee. Will he be able to do that? You're hoping by the last game of the season that you're able to. Arkansas, that to me is the more interesting one because like Brandon and I talked last week, they have a head coach coming in where this is his first Power 5 job. And what a conference to go into when this is your first Power 5 job. It's like saying, hey, I don't really know how to swim much. Here's the deep end. And Mm -hmm. you just push them right into that. So to me, if there's anything, those three games are the ones that I would target if I'm a fan of the Commodore saying, okay, we if we can get one or two of these, then we should be in good shape to where I feel like, okay, this is a season to build on. Because a lot of these teams at the bottom, it's not about, you're not just going to be like, boom, all the way to the top. Yep. You're going to have to build on it before you get back to or get to 
a team that's contending in the SEC. Well, I think the hire uh, of Kyle Tarver from from uh, Stanford, I believe, mm-hmm. um, massive hire. I think that again, that's the building block to get mm-hmm. you there. It's going to be bad losing Shermer next year, but if you're able again to just build off of that, um, find a quarterback that can step in. I, I think that this could be a Vanderbilt team that maybe has a bright future um, and maybe is able to get some 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 national recognition down the line. But you know, again, looking at this Vanderbilt team, it's just going to be more of the same mm-hmm. uh, from Vanderbilt. Maybe they get four wins in the SEC, but this isn't going to be a powerhouse in the SEC, uh, unfortunately, for the Commodores. Last thing I ask you, let's say this team goes five wins or less mm-hmm. overall. Do you think about firing Coach Mason? And this is, a, this is a question that I know Brandon and I have asked before the 27th season, whenever we talk hot seats. His name is usually one that comes up because it's, Overall, he's had, and this is overall records, three and nine, four and eight, six and seven, five and seven, with last year being the one and seven, his worst conference record since not winning a game his first year in 24. So last thing I'll kind of ask you is if they go five wins or less, is there a chance that Vanderbilt decides, let's get someone new in here? You've had five seasons. I think it's been enough. I'm going to up you and not say um, if, if just five wins is that benchmark. Mm-hmm. If they end up, let's see, if they lose the first four tough games. So if they if they start the season three and four. Mm-hmm. You think um, he's fired so, mid-season. So beat, beating Middle Tennessee, beating Nevada, mm-hmm. beating Tennessee State. If, if they lose at Florida, and I think if they lose at Kentucky, I think he's gone. I think mm-hmm. he's gone by... October twentieth, so October twenty seventh. Even if they win, so let's say by that point they'd be what three and four. Mm-hmm. Even if they're I think three if they and four? start, I think if they start off though on mm-hmm. uh, you know winless against the SEC, I think that's a fireable offense. I think especially if you if you start zero and four or zero and five, losing against South Carolina, Georgia, Florida, Kentucky, Vanderbilt, I think there's a possibility Derek Mason gets fired. Yeah, and that's one that, like I said, hopefully. As a Vanderbilt fan, you're not hoping for that because you're like, great, now we're starting the a true rebuild with a new head coach. But that is just one I had to throw out there because usually the last few times we've talked about hot seats here on the podcast, Derek Mason's name usually kind of creeps its way in there one way or another. I'm going to turn on to you guys, though. What do you guys think about Vanderbilt coming into the season how good is this offense going to be? Are we going to see improvements from the defense? What are you looking at for both offense and defense for this team? And then also, how do you see this season playing out for them? How many wins? How many losses? What's going to be the games you're looking for? What's going to be the games you're going to cover your eyes? Because you're just not going to watch Vanderbilt play that game. Let us know what you guys think down below in that comment section. Let's move on, though, into the next team. And these are preview, Sean. We're... We just keep going. They just keep going. Like mm-hmm. this is this is where we get the podcasting chops where we really test out our stamina yeah. for recording because you really got to have that long stamina to go especially when we add a Matt Patreon segment mm-hmm. at the beginning of them going eight segments deep on the podcast. Thanks today. for missing Brandon. Appreciate it. Well, it's not just that. Both yep. you and I had a 3-hour podcast. Mm-hmm. On Saturday that we recorded, and now we got one of these. The next team we're diving into is the Florida Gators. This is a team last year didn't do so didn't do so hot. And the reason why I say it like that is, like I said to you while we were fixing the camera and stuff, I go, this team was surprisingly bad this year. Mm-hmm. Didn't expect them to be like that. Where you look at two years ago, it was your top three teams. It's like, oh, who's going to win the SEC? As well, could be Florida, could be Tennessee, could be Georgia. Not the case last year. Obviously, Georgia ran away with it. But Florida, the big thing they got going for them this year is they get their guy. They get the new hire coming out of Mississippi State, an SEC guy. They get Dan Mullen, who's going to be Florida's – he was Florida's offensive coordinator during the two national championships they won under Urban Meyer. Mm -hmm. And this is what a little quote from Dan Mullen, I believe. He says, I know how important offense is here. I know everybody likes to score some points. I love scoring points. So for me, I'm going to ask you, what does Dan Mullen's hire mean for Florida? 
And will that translate into more points this year for the Gators? Well, I think Gator fans have to hope it will. But I think the biggest thing that Dan Mullen being hired means for the Gators is just another regime change, another guy you have to look mm-hmm. at and just wait and see because he isn't an Urban Meyer. He isn't a guy that's going to step in like a, a good old the good old ball coach and, and Steve Spurrier. Mm-hmm. You're going to have to wait. Is he, has he had success before? Yes, he's had 10 win seasons. He's had a nine win season. He's gone to a uh, bowl with his team um, ever since 2010. Mm-hmm. But we look at all these teams, and outside that 10 win season in 2014, there have been like the Gator Bowl, the Music City Bowl, the Belk Bowl, the St. Peter's Bowl, the Tax Slayer Bowl. He's not going to big name bowls. Now that he's at a bigger name program in Florida, that can change because you're going to get better recruits. You're going to be in the state of Florida, you're which consistently, to go to better bowls. Yeah, which, which consistently creates better players um, and better recruits. So I think it's the biggest thing is that you're going to have another regime change, and, and you're going to be bringing in a guy who's had sex, success before in the SEC. Does it mean it's going to translate into a better offense? Does it mean it's going to mm-hmm. translate into a uh, a better team on the field year one? It might not just because, again, you have the stench of McElwain still on that program. You still have the stench of Muschamp on that program. You need to rebuild, retool, strip it down, and, and build up. Are there still talented players in this team? Mm-hmm. 100%. That defense looks absolutely great. But offensively, I don't know what they're going to be doing. And the first question is that quarterback. The biggest, and that was where I was going to go, the biggest problem with this team is that they haven't had a quarterback throw for more than 16 touchdowns since 2009. Since they had a Mr. Tim Tebow as their starting quarterback, they have not had a quarterback throw for more than 16 touchdowns. That's not good. That is not good. And when you've got a guy like Felipe Franks, who many are thinking is going to be the guy to be the starter for Dan Mullen, it could also be Kyle Trask. I'll get to him in a second. But with Franks, the bad with him, eight interceptions last year. How many touchdowns did he have? Oh, only nine. So it wasn't that much better. Mm-hmm. Just over one to one touchdown to INT ratio. He was also sacked. 29 times and I know some people will come in I'll give a little credit to those sacks for the offensive line because they're not all on the quarterback some of those are on the offensive line but the question is what do you go with do you go with the guy in Felipe Franks who at least has experience as the starter I know last year it was all should it be him should it be Malik Zaire after Luke Del Rio went down with his injury I think it was a shoulder injury now it becomes, do you go with Felipe Franks, who has that experience, or do you go with the redshirt, uh, redshirt sophomore, I almost said freshmore, sophomore in Kyle Trask, who some are saying is the better pure passer, and also the thing that kind of plays into this is there was supposed to be another guy in this, mm-hmm. a Matt Corral, but he said, adios, I ain't coming here, I'm going to go somewhere else, and he transferred, I think it was to Old Miss, is where he's at now. So they right now they're believe they're with Franks or they're with Trask. With me, I don't know why if you're not Dan Mullen, it depends on how they play like in spring ball and over the summer. But if Trask shows you something, you're a new coach coming in, I would say I might take the risk and fly with the redshirt sophomore over Felipe Frank. I'm on the complete opposite side. It's the same reason I gave during the Tennessee uh, mm-hmm. a preview is that I want a guy in a new program. Yes, Dan Mullen's been in Florida before, but at a new program, at least to start the season, I want a guy with experience in there. I don't want a guy that's going to be, mm-hmm. you know, rushing decision making, hasn't been playing in a college game before in his career, and you're looking, you know, the offense is looking at him as, all right, call the shots, be a leader. Franks, he might not be a great leader i don't know um because i don't know the kid personally but mm-hmm. if he has the experience i think that's the biggest thing that's going to play into frank's um battle for the quarterback is that he has experience at florida he has experience with these guys before um and, and he's been in the locker room and, and consistently been on the field with them where yes you know again the, the redshirt sophomore um has been in the program but he hasn't been on the field with them so i think the biggest thing with frank's is that mm-hmm. he has the experience and i think dan mullen might look at that to at least rely on because hey you've been here before 
Um, you've played in uh, in in Florida before. Um, you've been in what, what's there, the swamp. Uh, you played in the swamp before. You know what it's like. Gainesville. Come in, come in here and, and, and at least lead our team in the first couple of games. Mm-hmm. Again, maybe talent will win out. And if he's that much talented than Franks, then I think he's going to end up winning out because Dan Mullen is a very strong um, head coach with a great background. I think that the guys, his, his guys are at least going to be able to respect that and stick with him and mm-hmm. believe in him. And I don't think you really need the experience too much. But if it comes down to, all right, these guys are, you know, the same player or at least, you know, very similar, it's not too much of an edge, I think Frank's experience might give him that edge um, and and make him a starting quarterback, at least to start for the Florida Gators. It's going to be a tough decision. I'm just throwing out there that it depends on all what we see. Obviously, if Trask comes out and it's like, oh, this guy shouldn't be starting, of course, go at Frank's. The thing that I wonder, though, but that's the thing. That's the thing. I I don't want to mm-hmm. get rid of like the guy that's been there for me, Franks. Mm-hmm. He's been there. I don't want to pull Just the carpet out, out right under away. from underneath him and throw him in. It's the same shit that happened with mm-hmm. the, the the Notre Dame Fighting Irish and Malik Zayer mm-hmm. and Sean Kaiser. And then Kaiser was there, transfer. yanked Kaiser, and then they put in. You no, know, it wasn't. It wasn't. Zayer was upset that he didn't okay. play enough, but Kaiser was. More experience. Mm-hmm. He was the better quarterback, but Brian Kelly didn't like Kaiser's attitude, mm-hmm. so he yanked Kaiser was out that the and threw season, in Zaire. That was the season where Kaiser was, had that game-winning pass against Virginia, right? No, it was Texas. Okay. Um, it was absolute bullshit. It was so stupid. Mm-hmm. It was it was the year before. Um, it was it was not last year, but the year before. Yeah. Um, and Kaiser was having a great game mm-hmm. against Texas, and they kept putting in Zaire. They kept putting in Zaire. They kept putting in Zaire, and the team was just looking terrible. It, the whole point that I'm trying to get though is. Kaiser was there. Mm-hmm. Kaiser was performing, and you don't want to at least hurt Frank's confidence. Con- confidence. You don't want to uh, even break his trust that his teammates might mm-hmm. have in him and throw in a sophomore just for Frank's to come back in. I think stick with the guy that has the experience, and, and it's a lot of pressure to throw on a redshirt sophomore. Here's ultimately how I feel like their quarterback situation will play out: is I feel like Frank's will be the starter. He'll be the one that is pegged that, so he'll be the sophomore starter this year. Then next year, they'll hopefully, knock on wood, no uh, answered moms or dads kind of uh, keep the letter of intent from getting faxed over to Florida. They're banking on the guy who committed in in April, who was, this was after Mullen got hired. He got hired in November. Jalen Jones committed to Florida. He's a quarterback, dual threat quarterback out of the Baltimore area. I think what will happen is if, knock on wood, he comes in, the plan is this is a Mullen guy. Frank starts this year. Frank's even starts next year in his junior year. And then hopefully after junior year, either after junior year, if Frank says, you know what, I'm going to go to the NFL draft for some reason, or if he does play his senior year, you feel it out that way. If Frank's leaves Mm -hmm. after his junior year, all right, Jalen Jones is now the guy in his sophomore year to take over, or if Franks plays in his senior year, all right, we're just going to have Jalen Jones come on up as a starting junior and kind of starting that trend of like, all right, we're going to have juniors and seniors starting in this quarterback role or redshirt sophomores if they're like a Jameis Winston level like talent. Well, and one thing too, going back to Mullen's quote about offense mm-hmm. and, and, and finding the quarterback down the road, the future I think is is, is bright for mm-hmm. for Florida. I'm, I'm not I'm not uh, departing that, but you look at what Mullen has done and Mullen did at, at Mississippi State. 2009 hit the 73rd uh, best offense in the NCAA. Then in 2010, 51st best offense in the NCAA. 73rd best offense in, in, in the NCAA. Next year, 60th best offense in the NCAA. 71st best offense in the NCAA. It wasn't until that 2014 season where he had the 15th best offense that scored over 30 points per game and then consistently from uh, 2014 to his last year at Mississippi State he's been able to get 30 points per game throughout the season so I think one thing is yes you can come in and be confident because I think he should be because he's been there before at Florida and Mm -hmm. he's had a a pretty decent resume um, at Mississippi State but saying I know how important offense is here I like to score some points if you're going out there and just throwing up another you know 26 points per game I think this might look bad on Mullen. I just feel like Florida fans might temper their uh, their their expectations for this offense because mm-hmm. there isn't a solid guy that we believe in um, at, at, at quarterback, and it sounds like everybody else who's covering the Florida Gators isn't really sold on a quarterback. Now, that might change from our fans, and I don't know if the Florida Gator fans will let us know, but I think you got to temper your expectations if you are the Florida Gator fans because Dan Mullen will be able to put out a, a great 
culture, a great system. He knows this Florida program before, but it's going to take a while for him to get that implemented. Does that mean this team could be a, a top 25 team this year? Possibly they might end up in mm-hmm. the top 25, but I don't think this team is going to be n- near the top of the, the SEC, it's, it's SEC East. Maybe they're you know third in the SEC East, maybe even second, but I, I don't think this is a team that's going to be able to put up a ton of points this year with the quarterback situation and kind of the questions they do have on offense. Well, and the one thing I am looking at right now is – the thing that's going to help you score points, especially when you're we're talking about the quarterback situation, is your wide receivers. And the big name that everyone probably knows about that's no longer there, Antonio Callaway. He's not mm-hmm. going to be with the Florida Gators. Right now you look at it, they've got guys like Tyree Cleveland and guys like Cardarius Tony, injury prone. What are we going to get out of them? To me, the big two names that they're – they are Florida banking on this season. And with the recent rule that the SEC passed during their um, media days, where the league had approved a rule change that grants eligibility for student athletes who graduate or transfer within the conference, according to multiple reports, this means that guys like um, from Old Miss, you have Van Jefferson, and then from Ohio State, you've got Trayvon Grimes. These are two guys that, with this rule change, might be able to play immediately, not have to sit out this season. So for me, once you figure out that quarterback question, let's say, for the sake of argument, the answer is Franks, then it becomes, what are we doing at wide receiver, and how are we going to use those wide receivers to make our quarterback better? and make it to where Franks maybe has 16 Mm -hmm. touchdowns this year. I I mean, it may, but 16 touchdowns, like, Boo fucking who cares? Like this, I'm just this saying. Like, I'm just saying. Like it's bad when Tim Tebow, who yeah, I know. NFL but I, I think it's, I don't think the guy that is currently on. I don't mm-hmm. think there's a guy on the roster that is the next Tim Tebow. I don't think there's a guy well, that's the next Chris Leak. Uh, even <laughs> I don't think the next guy is the next Cam mm-hmm. Newton, uh, who is on the Florida program. I, I think it's going to be a while until Dan Mullen's able to get this program underneath. And yes, mm-hmm. whether those tra- if the transfers come over, yes, yeah, it's going to help. Um, good old, good old Franks. But I don't, I don't know if it's going to be the thing that turns him in from a, a guy who's a, a first year starter to a guy that's going to lead them to a, a successful, um, you know, ten win season. I, I mm-hmm. think the biggest thing is just finding a balance and being able to sure this culture gets set up in Florida and being sure you can get some big wins. Um, you don't have to beat you know the the best of the best, but if you're able to at least be competitive, especially in that Florida Georgia game, I think that's going to be a good sign for Dan Mullen's program. And then you also look at what uh, they're bringing in on the defensive side and, and Tom Gratham. There's a very deep amount of talent on this this Florida defense. They underperformed last year and Florida's typically known for their defense. I know, you know, obviously the offense has been a big thing, um, mm-hmm. especially when they were winning national championships, but their defense consistently has been good. They've been consistently turning out NFL prospects. And I think that's a big thing is bringing in a guy that's been in the SEC, um, not only with Dan Mullen before at Mississippi State, but also being at Georgia before. I think it's going to be very interesting to see what Grantham can do with this well, I was defense ask because you there's a lot him. of talent on it. I was going to ask you about him because basically what I see with him is he's one of the, I don't know all the situations in college football, but he has to be one of the luckiest new coordinators in college football this year because it's like, great, I get to land this job and it I get to work with these players. Mm. Sweet. This is gonna be e- this is gonna be easy with what I can do. It's kind of like I'm gonna relate it to like a teacher coming out of college. You go to one school and it's like, great, I got no resources. What I'm gonna do? This is like he's going to that high-end school where it's like, what? I've got technology. I've got endless possibilities. Mm-hmm. Let's go. Let's do this. Well, and especially you know, especially for home games, I mean, he's going to have a swamp on his side. Mm-hmm. So I think that's the big thing is if Mullen's able to get up crowd support, mm-hmm. Grantham's going to – job is going to be even easier. So having guys, uh, especially on the outside, the secondary looks fantastic. Um, they have guys in the middle as well. Finally had a 100-plus 100, uh, 100, uh, tackler last year. I think they're going to be able to, you know, especially bringing him back, they're going to have a guy in the middle that's going to be successful. I think the biggest thing is – just making sure, again, your culture is established, and if fan support's behind them, this talent's going to be able to shine because that pressure's going to be off them. And then going away, you always have that mindset of, hey, we're going to be back at the swamp at some point, Mm -hmm. but also we have that fan support at home, and being able to push that into a defense, feed the defense, it's absolutely massive. And and that's the one reason why Florida's been consistently great defensively is because of their fans, because of that atmosphere of the swamp. You're consistently going into a hot, muggy place, and you're getting screamed at 
by 100,000 Florida Gator fans. So Grantham not only has it easy because of the talent on him, but he also has the, the, the success, the, the, the benefit of the program that he's going to. Um, so I think it's it's massive, and it's going to be such an easy job for Grantham. So that's one thing is you. it's going to be – we're saying it's going to be an easy job. Mm-hmm. If this defense sucks – you're gonna look right at Grantham yes. because you have the talent. Like you had all this. You have the program. Unless you there's have injuries. The stadium, you unless have the fans. there's injuries. Unless there's injuries, you're gonna look at them and be like, "All right, mm-hmm. you're a fucking problem." Yeah. So I think that's one thing with with the Gators. Last thing I'll ask is the schedule because for me, I look at it. Maybe this is me going back a year or two and thinking of that Florida team and kind of my I don't want to say bias, but what I've been used to with Florida being at the top of the division. I look at this schedule and I go, except for maybe the Mississippi State LSU Georgia game, very winnable games on the schedule. Like oh, I, agree. I like Charles, like all the non-conference Colorado State, Charleston Southern, uh, Florida State, um, I, I, Idaho, Florida State's interesting, be interesting to me because it's at Florida State. Well, that plus it's at the end of the year. It'll be a Thanksgiving um, weekend game. Like, Willie Taggart, what is he going to do in year one? And also what Brandon and I talked about, I think it was last week or two weeks ago. Yeah, two weeks ago with the whole Francois Blackman situation. Who's going to start at quarterback? How's that going to play out in itself? It's more winnable than it used to be is what I'm leaning towards in that Mm -hmm. one. And then SEC, like I said, Mississippi State. Yeah, I'm throwing it in there, but you'll probably win that one. Well, and that's one. one thing too is Mullen wants to win yeah, that one because he's going back. And he's going back, and it's at home. It's at home. It's at Mississippi, for Mississippi State. State. Yeah. So then, really, it's LSU and Georgia. Those are the two question marks in the Georgia yeah. game, neutral site game. Well, I don't really. I don't. I don't think even the LSU one's going to be a winnable mm-hmm. game because it's at the swamp. So true, and they've got questions at quarterback. I, I think. I think the the schedule and Geis is gone. Fournette's mm-hmm. gone. I mean, they don't have the same. And Chark's well, gone. Leonard Fournette's gone. They got his little brother, Leonard. Oh my bad. Leonard and uh, Leonard. But no, uh, the good Fournette. Um, yeah. is gone. Uh, Chark's gone. Mm-hmm. Geis is gone. I mean, they lost a lot of playmakers. I'm not a big fan of Ed Orgeron. Mm-hmm. Um, so I, I think that LSU game could be massively win- win- winnable. So, mm-hmm. I mean, looking at this Florida team, they might not have a great offense. They have talent on that defense, but it's got to come together. But even then, I still look at this Florida team. I think they can be a, a top 25 team again. You know, teams are going to be, I mean, games are going to be difficult. I mean, even Kentucky, even though they're not mm-hmm. a great team, they might, you know, come in early, especially coming off a pretty decent season punch for Kentucky. Mouth. Punch them in the mouth, especially when they're they're you know Florida isn't really um, settled as a team, not really mm-hmm. used with the with playing with under Dan Mullen. Um, same can go with the Tennessee game. That's at Tennessee. That's going to be one of the biggest games uh, for Jeremy Pruitt. If Jeremy Pruitt gets his guys fired up, that could be something that flips. So or like I think at Vanderbilt. Yeah. Um, no. No. Actually, no. I don't. I don't believe that. But well, I'm just saying, like being on the road eh, at Vanderbilt, like that could be going up against Vanderbilt. I'm. You should be a ten point. Favorite. I'm saying. I expect Florida to win that one, but I I look at that Vanderbilt game and I go, you know what? Maybe it's just the back of my head. A lapse of judgment game for Florida. Vanderbilt wins, and then Vanderbilt fans well, come back to this video and go, "Look at that! You doubted us. See, Look at what happened." <laughs> I'd give it to you if the Florida, if the Georgia game was the next, mm-hmm. the next week. Like but they have a looking ahead. They have a bye. Mm-hmm. So that's the thing is they're looking. They're not looking forward to Georgia. They're not getting amped up for Georgia. They're getting mm-hmm. amped up for their bye. Yeah. Um. So they're going to be able to put to get every, ready for Georgia. Yeah, they're going to put everything they have mm-hmm. into that game for Vanderbilt to make sure they go into that Georgia yeah. game with enough momentum, um, especially if they come off against a loss against LSU. Mm-hmm. I think Vanderbilt's just like a sitting duck there. I mean, they're, they're sitting duck with a guy with a shotgun who's five feet away from him. Um, so, yeah, I think... Poor, I think poor Va- Commodore fans. I think Vanderbilt gets exploded on that one. Um, but, yeah, I think I think Florida's going to have a pretty successful season. Yeah, this one should be a complete, almost a complete 180 for Florida back in the right direction. It's the... Perfect kind of, yes, there's questions on offense, but the defense should help carry this team. Plus the schedule. It would be different if it's like instead of... You have Bama, you have Auburn. Instead of like... Vanderbilt. Instead of Mississippi State and LSU, Mm -hmm. if you were to play at Bama and then home against Auburn, completely different story. Mm -hmm. Completely different story. You're probably losing those two and to Georgia because really I would give Georgia the... Um, favorite right now just because of what we've seen last year. But this is where I want to turn the question on to you guys. What do you think down below in the comment section? What do you expect from this offense? Who's going to be the starting quarterback? What do you expect from the offense to help out either quarterback that is starting? What do you think about the defense? And what do you think this team does this year in the SEC East? Let us know what you guys think down below 
in their comment section. Let's move on into the next team moving up. And this was a team, kind of like I said with Florida, shocked me that they were so low. This team shocked me that they were so high mm -hmm. in the standings last year. The Mizzou high. Tigers, 4-4. Four and four. Yeah, I know, I kind of cracked a little bit. 4-4 four and four in conference, 7-6 and six overall. Thing I want to start with this one, getting right into it, is what you kind of said. I was like, what should we start with? You said... Why not go with the quarterback? Well, it's clear. Drew Locke. It's Drew Locke. 43 touchdowns, 12 interceptions, 3,695 mm -hmm. yards. This is a guy coming into this year. He's got to be number one or number two quarterbacks on most NFL draft guys' um, big boards. 6'4", mm -hmm. 225. He's throwing the ball about 58.2%. Percent. He's throwing around 385, 435 times. And he almost times. left for the NFL. He almost left for the NFL, and he's he's a pretty decent runner, too. So, I mean, Drew Locke has everything mm -hmm. you want in a quarterback. He's got experience now. He's going to be a senior that's absolutely huge for this Tiger program. So, I look at this Missouri team. Yes, they were surprising, but, hey, when you have this great of a quarterback and you're going up against now this year, UT Martin, Wyoming, mm -hmm. Purdue, even uh, throwing Memphis in there. This could be a team that, hey, maybe you get nine wins, ten wins, because you have a great quarterback. Yeah, and I mean, the big thing on top of it is I can't wait. I wish we would have kept Matt on because I wanted to know what he thinks of that now Mizzou-Purdue game that's going to go on yeah. on September 15th. But to me, the big thing that was interesting with Drew Locke was, like I said, he was waiting. Like He was like, ah, should I go to the NFL? Should I stay here in Columbia? And he waited to make his decision until they found their new offensive coordinator. And what really got him to stay was this is this was a guy in Derek Dooley that was a Dallas Cowboy receivers coach, a former Tennessee head coach. And the big thing that I am interested for this Mizzou team is how he is going to Make because I'm assuming he's going to make Locke better by merging the worlds of the pro style offense with a run game and deep ball approach to where it's like, hey, we're going to run the ball, we're going to throw the ball deep. Now, I know what you're saying if you're a Mizzou fan, you're going, Ricky, we want to throw it deep, but we're missing one guy, we're missing our number one receiver last year. Jamon Moore. He was a guy that I know very well because I had him mocked in my full NFL mock draft last year. However, they do have guys behind Moore or coming back that were behind Moore that it's just a question of, do they step up? Does not Emmanuel Hall, who had over 800 yards last year and had 24.8 yards per catch last year, does he step up although he was battling injuries? Does sophomore with a name I'm probably going to screw up a lot this year, Albert Okwa Boom Boomnard. Gonna, Tr I'm just going to say Albert. Even close. Gonna just say Albert O is what I'm going to call him this year. He's a guy that could be a red zone threat at the tight end Okwa position. Okwa Boomnam. Closer Okwa than Boomnam. I was. Closer Okwa than Boomnam. I was. But it just depends of what are you going to do with the pieces around Drew Locke because I feel like. Drew Dooley is going to be able to bring out the most of Locke. Well, I think the biggest thing oh, for Drew Locke, Locke, I think the biggest thing for Locke, too, is he, get, he got more consistent as the season went on. And when they were losing, they were bad. In that stretch where they started 1-5, and five, he was completing uh, passes about 53%. He was 17, uh, 17 touchdowns and 7 uh, interceptions. Was helped by a Missouri State game that he had 7 touchdowns in. But even after that, uh, you know, went up against Idaho, had a 6-touchdown six six interception game, and he finished the last 7 games, 61.6 .6 completion percent, 2,224 yards, 27 touchdowns, and 6 interceptions. He showed off, and he was up going up against, again, a, a team of Florida that was talented. Tennessee, one of the worst defenses last year, but still went off. Vanderbilt had a nice game in that Arkansas game, that last game of their regular season, 25 completions, 42 um, attempts, 59.5% completion percentage, five touchdowns, two interceptions. He has the ability to take over games. I think that's the biggest thing for Missouri mm -hmm. is throughout my lifetime, uh, you know, when Missouri has done well, they've had a good quarterback. Blaine Gabbert, Chase Daniels, this Drew Locke might be the next guy who's able to take them you know, fairly deep. They were able to win that back half mm -hmm. of that SEC uh, schedule and show up and had a really nice season. So I think that's going to be the biggest thing for Missouri is having consistency and not having those big spurts. Not going 6-0 and oh, uh, at the end of the season and not mm -hmm. starting off 1-5. and five. If they're able to have a consistent season, I think it's going to be so uh, massive for Drew Locke's growth as a quarterback. 
Um, yes, you have a ton of confidence going into that bowl game, having mm-hmm. six straight wins. But if you know you can go in on any single week and win the game and be able to win one, lose one, and come back and win one, I think that's the biggest thing for at least the, the, the Missouri Tigers is having that consistency. I'm not too worried about the weapons he's losing. I'm not too worried about uh, the weapons around Drew Locke because I think great quarterbacks make their weapons around mm-hmm. them better. And I still think he has some pretty solid receivers on the outside that's going to help him. So I look at this Missouri Tiger team, and I think they might be a sleeper this year. Well, and the thing you got to look at, too, is the defense, because this is a defense that not only has been known for their D-line play, they're also going to, to me, they're going to have a really good front seven, and mainly their linebacking core is stacked. They've got guys like Therese Hall. They've got guys like Kale Garrett. They've got guys like Brandon Lee who combined for a combined 27.5 tackles for loss, four and a half sacks, and 10 pass defenses last year. That is insane from the linebacker position. This is what I wonder. Can the defense do enough to get off the field quickly and not let the other team score? Duh, that's what defenses do. And can the weapons around lock do enough to help this team and boost this team because right now you're kind of in like if you stay the same as you were last year you're kind of in a limbo and that's the only thing I fear for this team because I expect Florida to get better I expect Vanderbilt to maybe get a little better I expect Tennessee to get better the out of the three teams below you I expect two of them to be a lot better than they were last year are you going to basically it's an adapt or die situation are you going to adapt and stay ahead of teams like Florida, Tennessee, and make the jump over teams like Kentucky and Southern Ca- or South Carolina? Mm-hmm. Or are you going to stay where you are and kind of stay in a limbo right there fourth in the SEC? But I think the biggest thing for Missouri is that, you know, again, we look at what they did last year, having those mm-hmm. six straight wins. You're getting the biggest games off your schedule right away. Because, yes, you're going to have to go up against Tennessee Martin. You're going to go up against Wyoming, you're going to go up against Purdue. Um, I think you can win those three games, start off 3-0. Then you're going to host Georgia. Now, if that's a close game, you're still going to have confidence because, hey, we just lost a close game to you know the net run, mm-hmm. uh, you know runners-up in the national championship yeah. last year. And then you look at that South Carolina game. Going to be another big game. Then you go up against Alabama. That's three games right there that's going mm-hmm. to be rough. It's going to be tough. You're going up against uh, good old Kirby. You're going up against Will Muschamp. You're going up against Saban. But if you're able to escape that one mm-hmm. and two and with a fairly decent uh, you know, uh, point differential in those games. I think you got to be confident, especially with the way they finished last year with six straight wins. Then you go up against Memphis. That's going to be, you know, Memphis is a pretty decent um, non non power five, but still, it's a game that you should win, especially at home. Mm-hmm. Then you go up against Kentucky. You're better than Kentucky. You're going up against Florida. They have a first year head coach. Then you go up against Vanderbilt. That could be a slaughter. Tennessee, another first year head coach, and then you round it out against Arkansas. This could be a team that goes on another six game win streak to end the Mm -hmm. season and gets nine wins and that would be a massive success for this Missouri football program I don't see six wins I know that you're just comparing that to last year I don't see six wins at the end of the year and the only reason I say that is Florida I think to me it's fair and it's at Florida to me there are three for sure losses on the schedule for me home against Georgia at Brian Denny Stadium at the Swamp those are the only three that are for sure. Then to me, there are. I wouldn't chuck. I would say. I would say there's two for sure losses. Georgia and uh, Georgia, Alabama. Georgia and Bama. And then I would say there's two toss up games. I would say there's two that. Here, I would say there's two that they're mm-hmm. not favored in, and that's the South Carolina game because it's at South Carolina, mm-hmm. and then the Florida game because they're at the Swamp. But other than that, I think they should either be favored or they mm-hmm. should be toss ups. I I am looking at it where my for sure I'm going to throw Florida into that. So there's three. Then to me, I feel like they beat. South Carolina this year because for me, I might be a little lower on South Carolina than many people might want. I don't me trust to, a Will Muschamp team. That's just something that I'm thinking about. The other three games that I don't like, they're not going to be losses for sure, but I don't know how they're going to go. Are at Purdue, mm-hmm. like we were talking to Matt before his segment or after his segment because I was trying to get him on the Purdue segment that we're going to be doing next month when we do the Big Ten preview of, and he was like, wow, I'm actually excited to talk about Purdue football before a season in a long time. So they're supposed to be better. That could be a loss. I'm not saying it will be, but it could be. 
Vanderbilt, I think, will be a win for Mizzou, but with what we just talked about with Vanderbilt, anything like that game, I could see it being an upset game, and we're looking at that going, what? Mizzou lost to who? Mm -hmm. They lost to who? That I that's the only way I see that going as a loss. But Tennessee's the other one because Jerry Pruitt's going to get things done. It's just does he get them done this year? So to me, if everything goes right, you're looking at a three loss team at the end of the regular season. If everything goes wrong, then maybe they're a four, five, six loss team like they were last year. I don't see them falling below they were last year. But the highest I see them getting this year is a three-loss team, which, to put that in perspective, that would be good enough, if we're going off of last year, to be second in the SEC East. Yeah, but, but it's going to be different with this SEC East because, again, Florida's better. Tennessee, mm-hmm. you think, is going to be better. Yeah. Um, South Carolina, you know, third year be a under Muschamp. East. It's going to be a closer East, I think. I don't think it's going to be as bad because mm-hmm. so many teams fell off. Missouri went on that crazy run. Or is it just I Georgia mean, runs away with it and I think everyone George, else is I think is Georgia close. runs away with it, but I think mm-hmm. I think it's the teams are going to be better and they're going to be yeah. more consistent because no team outside of Georgia was really consistent mm-hmm. last year, maybe South Carolina. Um and, and maybe even Kentucky. But, like, there wasn't a lot of consistency in that SEC East. Mm-hmm. Um, so I think if Missouri, again, is consistent, I think that's going to play big into them. Yes, they might lose those three games against South Carolina, Alabama, Auburn, give you a three-game losing streak. But, again, if they're close, I think that's going to be enough confidence. I think that's going to be the biggest thing is as long as they're able to keep their confidence, you have the great quarterback, a guy mm-hmm. that's going to be an NFL pro behind you or behind the starting center leading you, I think that's going to be the biggest thing for Drew Locke is, is, is if he's able to take this team, put them on their back and say, all right, guys, on day in, day out, you're going to be able to trust me. I'm not going to put us in positions to lose mm-hmm. games. I think that's going to be massive for this Missouri team. And if he's able to bring those, those do interception numbers down Do you think he's going to do a lot of the – do you think he'll have to do a lot of the carrying or will we see any of these receivers and – um, well, running back step up. I don't think it, or not get injured. See, I don't think that that's a big thing because even if they do step up, the credit's still going to Drew Lock. Mm-hmm. So I think they're going to do enough. I think he's going to find them when they're open. I think you know they're still talented athletes. Let me put it this way: Will we have a LeBron James in the final situation where no, we're I don't looking at you, Drew Lock? You don't, you don't see that in football. Where we're looking at Drew Lock on man, if he had just a little bit better wide receivers, oh. maybe they I win mean, some games. Maybe, but I, I think it's more of. The scheme, more of the defense. Will the defense mm-hmm. be able to keep the pressure off lock? Will he be able to get a break? Um, mm-hmm. I think if he's and, and and the biggest thing too is if he's able to make the right reads. It doesn't matter who's out there as long as they're catching balls. I mean, maybe if it's like a, a good old Cleveland Brown scenario where you know they're zero and sixteen and they're mm-hmm. about to finally beat the Pittsburgh Steelers in the in the sixteenth game and Corey Coleman drops a easily easily catchable ball on the, mm-hmm. on, the, on, the, on the on the sideline. Then yeah, maybe we'll be saying that, but. Overall, throughout the season, I think it's just going to be more of what can Drew Locke do, what is he limited, and how high is he going to be going in the NFL draft, and can he get this Missouri team nine wins? Yeah, and I mean, just looking here at what other people are saying, um, the quote I'll read is, there's just enough turnover to give one pause, but most of the reason for last year's second-half surge um, return. That suggests a pretty high floor in a division that features quite a few teams that bottomed out in 2017. So really it depends on what are we going to see from this SEC East. Are we going to see the teams like we talked about, Tennessee, Florida, get better and kind of challenge? Or will this be a Mizzou team where it's like, hey, you guys are down there. We beat you guys again. We're going after the Kentuckys. We're going after the South Carolinas because I just don't think they'll ever this season, they won't ever get this year to the same level as a Georgia, as an Auburn, as an Alabama, respectively. I don't think that's a slap in the face to anyone in Columbia, but this is where you guys come in. Let us know what you think down below in the comment section about Drew Locke, about the Mizzou Tigers, and how you think the football season is going to go this year. Let's move on, though, into the next team. We got three left going into the Kentucky Wildcats. And the first thing I want to lead off with them is... Just a little look at last season. Mm-hmm. I prepped you for one thing. I'm going to throw another thing yeah, at you, Sean. Cool, great. This is a team that was two plays away against Florida and against Old Miss from winning six SEC games last year. They finished four and four. Two plays bounced the other way. They go six and four in co- or six and two in conference. They go what they would have finished. 
nine and five overall and would have been the second best team in the SEC. The bad news of like that was the good news. The bad news last year is they were outgained by nearly 75 yards per game in league play and out of the last four of their final games overall. So for me, well, for you, I'll ask, mm-hmm. looking at that coming into this season, can Kentucky fans kind of assume that, hey, maybe it's going to be a little bit different this year than it was last year? I don't know if it's really going to be different because looking at the team, it's not. there's not any major mm-hmm. things that I look at that really jump off the page. And I think the one thing, too, is in big games, you know, Kentucky didn't play. Against Georgia, they got smoked, 42-13. to 13. Yes, that was at Georgia, but still, mm-hmm. I mean, it wasn't close. You look at that Louisville game at Kentucky. That's a massive game right there, fighting for the bragging rights of, uh, of Kentucky there. Mm-hmm. You get smoked, 44-17. to 17. In the Music City Bowl, 24-23, you lose to Northwestern. And then also that Florida game, you lose there. You say two plays away. Um, you lose against Ole Miss. You weren't able to win the big games. Yeah, you beat... Uh, Kentucky, or you beat Southern Miss, you beat Eastern Kentucky, you got a win over South Carolina, and you beat Eastern Michigan, but outside of that, there's nothing that really surprises me or, or, or gives me too much hope. You beat teams that you were supposed to, and you got mm-hmm. blown out in teams that you weren't supposed to even be close at. Um, I, I look at this Kentucky team, and I, I think it's going to be more of the same this year. Um, you know, Central Michigan, I think Kentucky should win that one. I think they're probably going to lose to Florida um, against Dan Mullen. I think Mullen's better the, a, a better coach than McIlwain, and I think, you know, now this is going to be a Florida team with a true coach and a true direction. They'll beat Murray State Mississippi will be a close game, but uh, you know I, I think Kentucky should be favored because it's a new new regime there. Um, South Carolina they should lose Texas A and M with Jimbo Fisher. I think they probably lose that one, especially being mm-hmm. at Texas A and M. Vanderbilt they should win that one. Missouri that's at Missouri. I favor Missouri in that one. Georgia they're probably going to get smoked. Tennessee they should win that one, but I wouldn't see, be surprised again like we talked about in the Tennessee football uh, preview if Tennessee was able to win that one at Tennessee. Middle Tennessee you should win there, and with Louisville. Lamar Jackson's gone, but you still got smoked here's by forty four seventeen in that game. So here's my biggest worry. I think I think this is a team that's in the middle of the pack. I don't even think that this could be a team that's a bottom feeder this year mm. in the SEC East. The reason why I say that is I told you the good, I told you the bad. Do you want to know the worst for this team coming into this year? Mm. They don't have a quarterback who has taken an FBF an FBS snap. That doesn't matter to me. They haven't taken, like, this is, it's like, for me, I look at it, and it's like, all right, who are you going to start? Terry Wilson, who, yeah, he he began his career at Oregon, then he came from JUCO, or are you going to go with Gunnar Hoke, who apparently ended the spring as the front runner for the starting job? Mm -hmm. To me, I think that's going to play a, I'm not saying it's like, oh, you're not going to win a single game this year. I think that's going to play into it, especially if... Hoke is the guy, maybe over a Wilson, who has, has at least been at a JUCO and have gotten some snaps. Let's look at this, though. Who was the national championship runner-up? Georgia. Mm-hmm. They had a freshman quarterback. Let's look at the team that won the national championship. Mm-hmm. who they win it with? A freshman True. quarterback. It doesn't matter if you haven't taken an FBS snap. It's matter, it matters if you can throw the, the damn ball. And the one thing, or if you can run the ball. If the you, if you the can only be a thing threat. I would say to that, too, is the coaches— Nick Saban much and Kirby different. Smart, much different much than different. Mark but, Stoops. But still, I mean, mm-hmm. this is that's not the big. Like, you gotta you gotta play a snap mm-hmm. before. Like the questions with Tennessee is, we've seen those guys play snaps. Yeah, they weren't that damn good. So that's that's the thing with that is with I just Kentucky, wanted, like, we don't know what we're gonna get. But that's not my biggest worry. My biggest worry mm-hmm. is if if you can be consistent and if you're mm-hmm. gonna be able to show up and win some games you aren't supposed to. Who would you do? You have an idea of who you would go with? Because apparently, from what I'm reading. Gunnar Hoke was the guy out of spring because he's the more traditional pro style guy, mm-hmm. and he's been in this playbook for two years. Well, that, that, that's the thing. I'd go with Gunnar Hoke because yes, he hasn't played taken a snap, but he's taken snaps in practice. Mm-hmm. He's taken snap with these guys before. Um, you know, Terry Wilson could be a guy that they use in different packages because he's a guy that does have some some wheels on him, especially having uh, Benny Snell back there in the backfield throwing some looks at there where they could do uh, a read option where they can, they can really you know um, run some speed options on the outside. Mm-hmm. I, I think knowing that Kentucky. Offense, I think that um, you know Terry Wilson could be a guy that ends up nudging himself out if he's able to show that he's a dynamic playmaker, especially having his second chance now um, in the NCAA after being in JUCO and after you know going mm-hmm. away from Oregon. Um, I think Hope probably gets the starting job, but I, I think this is going to be something where we might see a quarterback by committee where whoever's hot 
goes in. I think that might Hopefully be the, the best like thing. Hopefully it's not like the Kaiser Zaire well, that quarterback was different. swap. That, that was different, though. I mean, oh, I know. It, Ky- Kaiser was by far the better quarterback. Let's Quit hope, bringing up bad memories. Let's hope we don't see a game like you just talked Malik, about earlier in this podcast. Malik Zaire was, was supposed to be an athlete and wasn't yeah. that good of an athlete. Um, mm-hmm. So, I mean, it, it's it's like one of the, the coaches that we know when we talk to, mm-hmm. the worst combination in, in, in basketball is being small and slow. Well, mm-hmm. you know, my, Malik Zaire was big and slow and couldn't throw the ball. Mm-hmm. And it's the worst combination for a quarterback. So I think Terry Wilson and Gunnar Hope gives them options. I don't know which one's the best option because mm-hmm. we, we haven't been able to see, see too much of them. It's going to yeah. really be dependent on how they look in their first couple of games. And I think looking at this schedule, I think we might see something where in that Central, Central Michigan game, in that Murray State game, um, we might see – both of these guys get a half, or, or both of these guys get a start. Maybe that True. Central Michigan game, Hoke gets a start, and then when uh, you know Murray State comes around um, at Kentucky, then Wilson gets a start. I, I think maybe uh, for the first two games, we see Hoke um, start, and if he's winning games and if he's looking good out there, I think they stick with him. Um, but I think after that Florida game, if Hoke's looking all, all right, if he's looking okay, they throw in uh, mm-hmm. Terry Wilson and see what he can do in, in a start against Murray State. The rough thing about that strategy is I feel like if you do that, the Central Michigan game is the only game you do that with. And the only reason why is because Florida at the Swamp is my second game on the year. If I don't have my starting quarterback solidified by week one, and I'm using week one to kind of help decide, I want my starting quarterback solidified by that Saturday night because I want to then be able to prep him on Monday getting ready for Florida and not have to worry about who is still my starting quarterback. The guy on this offense, though, that I think is going to be the biggest, um, what's the word I'm looking for, the biggest guy that they lean on this year mm-hmm. is their running back in uh, Benny Snell. Mm-hmm. And the reason why I say that is doesn't matter who your quarterback is, this is the kid that shined a lot last year because they have the question at quarterback of who do we start, he's going to have to kind of take over some games and kind of be like, I'm going to be the anchor On this offense. Yes, their offensive line returns four of their five starters. That should help Snell out. That should even help the quarterbacks out a little bit. But to me, it's like, all right, let's use the run game to help take some pressure off of whichever one of these quarterbacks is our starting quarter is our starter this year. And when you look at previews and stuff that say that, oh, well, Snell could break the program's career rushing record. Mm-hmm. He could with a real strong junior season. Yeah, and I think uh, you know, looking at Benny Snell, I mean, this is a guy that you know possibly could be gone after this year. Mm-hmm. Looking at the NFL, um, being a junior now, being eligible after this year, I think it's going to be someone that's you know really can make a name for himself, and it's going to be a massive year for Benny Snell, not only for his team trying to help his team win, but majorly like how is he going to help himself at the next level? Um, so Benny Snell, he's a guy that's going to be motivated. He's going to be a guy that with another year under his belt throughout his career at Kentucky he's averaged over five yards per carry um, 18 touchdowns last year 13 touchdowns uh, in in his freshman year and that's absolutely ridiculous talking about uh, a guy already with 31 rushing touchdowns Mm -hmm. in only two years and he's still got another one after Um, Benny Snell is gonna be a guy that you know that's why I'm not too worried about that quarterback situation because Mm -hmm. both those guys as long as they can hand off to Benny Snell it's not gonna be too much of a a difference see um, Um, so I, I really like Benny Snell the only downside about him is he's not a, a guy that's going to come out of the backfield and catch the mm-hmm. pass for you. But that's the thing where, like, you say, oh, I don't worry about that because of a guy like Benny Snell. I still worry about that quarterback decision only because if you don't have a competent quarterback back there this season, there's two ways I see this year going. Let's say a guy like, we'll say Gunnar Hoke because he's the guy that people are saying had a really strong spring and is the front runner right now. If he comes out as consistent, this could be a team that wins seven games this year for the first time under Mark Stoops. However, like you listed off, if the quarterbacks aren't up to snuff and the rest of the talent on this team, which is some good talent, doesn't have that support from the most important position on offense, you went through the schedule. Florida would be a loss. I would say Mississippi State would be a loss. Texas A&M would be a loss. Georgia, I'll say LSU. And then after that, I'll throw in even Tennessee or a possible Tennessee and a possible either Missouri Vanderbilt. Take your pick. I'm going to go with Mizzou because it's on the road and they've got the better just all Mm -hmm. over 
situation on offense than Vanderbilt does. If those two what ifs and those five for sure's for me happen, that's a seven loss season. You're not even making it's like you're not just dropping into a lesser bowl. You're dropping out of the postseason altogether. Yeah, I don't know if that's going to be really. In my mind, I don't see that happening because mm-hmm. I think Central Michigan's a win. Murray State's a win. Uh, Vanderbilt's a win. Uh, Tennessee, I think, should be a win. Middle Tennessee State, mm-hmm. Middle Tennessee, um, should be a win. So that's right there, five wins. And, and then the other ones, Missouri toss up, mm-hmm. uh, Louisville toss up, especially with Lamar gone. Um, Texas A&M could be a toss up too. We don't know how Jimbo is going to do in his first year. Um, Mississippi State even a toss up. And Florida first, that's going to be mm-hmm. one of the first games for that Florida team. If Florida loses their first game, and I mm-hmm. don't think they will because I think they have a really easy game in their first one. But it's going to be the first test of Dan Mullen and that Florida team. Yes, it was in the swamp, but this team, the Kentucky team last year. You know, gave Florida hell Florida at the swamp. Florida is so, playing Charleston Southern in yeah, the first so game. so it's going to be a, a breeze for Florida on that one. Mm-hmm. So this is going to be the first real test for both teams. I, I think that there are five for sure wins, and I think there are three toss-ups. So that I'm not looking at five, uh, you know, five wins. I'm mm-hmm. looking at five losses going eight and five possibly. Well, let's put it the same. Like, me and you are pretty much the same looking into it. Is Sorry, you see, five, seven and five. You see five for sure wins with three toss-ups. I see five for sure losses with two toss ups. So mm-hmm. for me, that's going to be the kind of with the quarterback is which team are you going to make this team? Are you going to help this team be the one where Sean has them? Five well, for sure wins you're can worried, get them and, to and seven. You're worried about the quarterback. I'm not too worried yeah. about the quarterback. Well, and that's if, what I'm if saying. They, if they get the quarterback, it'll be fine. Is, I think it'll be fine. They have two that, options. But that quarterback situation is like, let's say we have. Your seven wins, I'm going to throw your two what-ifs as wins, my two what-ifs as losses. Seven wins and seven losses are kind of doing this teeter-totter thing back and forth. The pillar in the middle that it's teetering on is the quarterback. If quarterback comes in, whether it's Hoke, whether it's Wilson, and they're competent, then all right, then it may sway into your seven wins, and they will have a really good season. Or if they come in... Mistake ridden, not well, really. Well, they're getting mistake ridden, then those five ex- for sure is turned exactly. losses. Exactly, and it's I, like I'm just not too worried about that, it though. That's you have where two it is. Options. Of, but it's I'm saying it's just what what are we going to see? And there's no but for sure of what we are. Let's look in Kentucky. Kentucky's mm-hmm. never had great quarterbacks. The last great quarterback they had was Tim Couch. Like they don't mm-hmm. have great quarterbacks consistently. So as long as they're competent, as long as they're going. You know, mm-hmm. nine touchdowns, nine interceptions, and they have like a 55% completion rate, 54% completion rate. They're able to run the read option fairly decent. They're going to be fine. Last year, and this is a low benchmark because, like you said, quarterbacks at Kentucky don't really fly off the stat. If you're a quarterback at Kentucky, all you need to do, at the least in my mind, is have a season like Steven Johnson last year. Complete 60, 61% of your passes. Throw for at least 2,000 yards, touchdowns of 10 to 4, touchdown to interception ratio. Let Benny Snell do it all. Ha- let him have his 18, maybe 20 touchdowns this year, and then you will be a team that's winning five to six to seven games this year. Yeah, I think that's the thing. I don't think Stoops is going to take a step back because mm-hmm. consistently he's either stayed a 5 at 7, but he's made that jump up to 7 and 5. I think mm-hmm. if he takes a step back, it's going to be one loss. But I don't think Mark Stoops is a great coach, but I don't think he's a bad bad enough coach to, to turn this team completely around just mm-hmm. because of a quarterback change. And the quarterback change, you didn't lose a guy yeah. like you know Carson Wentz. You didn't mm-hmm. lose a guy like Sam Darnold. You he lost. had his worst season in 2013, first year, 2 and 10, didn't win a conference game. Mm-hmm. Then two 5 and 7 seasons, 2 and 6 in conference. Then the last two years, it's been seven and six, now, four and four. The in East conference. has gotten better, but the East is still young. I mm-hmm. mean, Tennessee, brand new coach. Um, we're talking about Vanderbilt's coach possibly being on the the hot seat. Mm-hmm. We're looking at Drew Locke if he if he's able to you know have a defense behind him. We're looking at Florida with Dan Mullen being new. Um, you know, South Carolina. Will Muschamp is an okay coach, but is he a great coach? Like, there's a, the only for sure thing mm-hmm. in the SEC East is Georgia, and outside of that. Yeah. There, there isn't a for sure team. So that's why I think Kentucky I mean, can, can end up with seven wins, five, I mean, you eight, look or eight, at, possibly even eight wins. You look at two of the other games. I know Brandon and I talked about these two teams last week. You kind of mentioned it. Texas A&M, Jimbo Fisher coming in, plus they have a question at quarterback of who's going to start there. And then Mississippi State, yeah, they got Nick Fitzgerald, but they've got a new head coach there as well. So there are the good thing for Kentucky 
a lot of questions about these teams. And South Carolina, who we're going to get to next, it really, for me, with them is, are they going to be the same team? Because I didn't expect them last year to be the second best team in the SEC East. So Kentucky, to me, my final thought, kind of to put a linchpin in it, is what do we get from the quarterback? If we get at least what I said from those Steven Johnson stats, don't turn over the ball a lot, give me a few touchdowns, complete 61% of your passes, then you'll be good. But if it's the other side, you're turning the ball over more than you're scoring touchdowns, you're completing under 60% of your passes, then we could see this team slip into, ooh, they're in a lesser bowl game or maybe out of the postseason altogether. Final thoughts on Kentucky before we move to South Carolina. Again, like most of the teams we've talked about so far, if you find consistency, I think this team mm-hmm. could be a, 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 a decent team that gets seven wins. And the consistency isn't really in the games itself, but really at the at the quarterback position for Kentucky. Well, this is where you guys come in. Let us know what you think down below in that comment section. What do you expect from the quarterback position this year? What do you expect from Kentucky? How many wins and losses do you see for this team in 2018? Let us know what you think down below. In that comment section, let's move on, though, into the next team. We're almost at the end, Sean. Almost there. We got two more left. Looking at the South Carolina Gamecocks in this segment of the podcast. And this is a team kind of turned some heads last year. I definitely turned my head. Going 9-4 and four overall, 5-3 and three in the conference last year. This is a team that, I mean mainly for me, I wasn't expecting it because, I mean, Will Muschamp teams mm-hmm. don't really expect nine wins, and especially six and seven his first year, three and five in the conference. But this is a South Carolina team where, to me, the biggest question that I'll start with is, yeah, you've got on defense, they have to replace a ton of pieces, and that could be a problem. But to me, I usually look to offense. It's just the kind of guy that I am. And to me... The two big questions for offense is, number one, what are we going to see under the new offensive coordinator of Brian McClendon, who is now Muschamp's fourth offensive coordinator Mm -hmm. in his seven seasons as a head coach, and what kind of a quarterback-wide receiver combination are we going to see because of that? What do you think for this offense with a now new offensive coordinator yet again for a Will Muschamp team. Well, I, the biggest thing is they they need to pick up it, pick it up on the offensive side. I mean, this mm-hmm. is one of the worst uh, offenses in, in in the SEC. I mean, obviously we know what Muschamp can do with defenses, um, but I, I, it, the McClell, McClellan needs to really be able to bring in a, a Who's fresh an in-house change. guy, by the yeah, way. Yeah, he needs to bring a, a fresh change. And I think, you know, he's talking about going to an up-tempo uh, offense. I think that's going to be the biggest thing mm-hmm. for them is if they're able to at least tire out a defense and then have the offense go up against that monster mm-hmm. of a defense in South Carolina, that's going to be something huge. Because if you're able to keep the opposing defenses on their toes and then consistently have them keep coming out because you keep shutting mm-hmm. down the opposition on four and outs, on short drives, that's going to tire them out and it's going to make you you know open up the offense open them up left and right and you look to that outback bowl where they did have success against michigan and michigan was a fantastic defense mm-hmm. last year that was the the bright spot of that michigan team and you look what jake bentley did 239 yards two touchdowns one interceptions you look at the receiving they had uh you know a, a couple guys uh, they had uh, pretty much most of their guys um you know hayden hurst was one of them. obviously he's gone but they had guys with five catches three catches three catches four catches they were able to at least include a lot of different guys um and that was with uh, their leading rusher only having four, 45 yards on the ground. So I think the biggest thing for South Carolina is just having consistent guys out there. And mm-hmm. it's really not having a star wide receiver um, out there like an Alshon Jeffrey or Hayden Hurst, who was a star mm-hmm. for them. Um, I, I think it's just more having consistent guys that they can go to um, and consistent guys that they can continue to run out on the field and just do something for them, Have make them have a, a contribution, keep that offense mm-hmm. up pace, and again, slowing down some of these um, the, these quick fast-paced um, SEC defenses. If they're able to keep those SEC defenses on their toes, that's going to be massive. They were able to do that against Michigan. I think it's going to be uh, probably the, the key for them to have success this year. Well, and the thing that I'm kind of leaning to and kind of seeing with um, some of McClendon's um, quotes that he's been saying is it kind of seems like he's going to go more of an up-tempo style. I'm not talking like Chip Kelly up-tempo, but more so maybe like what – I know you and I, when we were in college doing the sports media thing also, 
Um, they're kind of the up tempo that we're used to of like quarterback. And it's not a full huddle. It's all right, get to the line, go to the side, get the play. All right, come back, hike. And one of the quotes I've got here from McClendon said, it's really simple. The more plays you run, the more opportunity you get for yards and points. You just get more at bats. That's the biggest thing. We're going to try to keep snapping the ball and keep getting points. That's the plan. We want to be balanced and stay aggressive and be in attack mode as much as possible. And part of me likes this because part of me feels like based off of the schedule that they got played this year, how is that Georgia game number two overall second week of the season going to play out with that mentality? Because Mm -hmm. to be honest, with this mentality, without this mentality, most people are expecting them to beat Coastal Carolina. I don't care if Coastal Carolina played a close game against an SEC team last year. Most teams are expecting, if you're from the SEC, to beat Coastal Carolina. And it was, I believe... Let me see. What was that close game that they had? Oh, it was Arkansas. Mm -hmm. Arkansas, they only lost 39-38. to But to me, it's that Georgia game. If you come out against Georgia, a Georgia team that's going to be playing Austin P in its first game, so not the most struggling of teams in that first week. If you come out against Georgia, especially getting the ball first, what if you win the coin toss? You say, we want the ball, we're going to score, Matt Hasselbeck style, and then you quick offense – Boom, 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 boom. Punch Georgia in the face right away. Score first on him mm-hmm. on that drive without taking much time off the board. What is that going to do well, tempo-wise for an early game, which part of me coming in looking at the schedule was like, oh, you're playing Georgia I, that soon? I don't know how confident see, I am about that. I, I look at the schedule, and I I, I love it. I, mm-hmm. I'm, I'm disagreeing with you. I love the schedule because you look at it, three games at home. Mm-hmm. Then you go – Two game break. You go to Vanderbilt, mm-hmm. which should be a winnable game, and Kentucky which should be, could a be a winnable game. game. And then you look at three straight games at home: mm-hmm. Missouri, Texas A and M, Tennessee. All of those winnable games. All of those at home. Then you take a two game break. You go on the road: Ole Miss, Florida. You know, uh, two tough, tougher opponents, mm-hmm. but still winnable games. And then you come back: Chattanooga, Clemson, both at home. Clemson's going to be a tough game, but still, you're at home. And, and, and the biggest thing is you're getting, you know, time off. You're playing at home mm-hmm. for consecutive stretches. You're not going back, forth, back, forth, back, forth. I absolutely love the schedule. Yes, are you going to have tough teams? Yes, but every SEC team is going to. And you have two of your two of the, the two hardest opponents on your schedule at home, Georgia and Clemson, and they are miles apart. Start of the season, end of the season. Love this schedule for, for South Carolina. And you talk about the, the up-tempo and at least you the— You said Clemson's at home? Oh, Clemson, South Clemson's Carolina. Clemson's on the ropes. My yeah. bad. Still in, in South Carolina. I saw yeah. Cle- I saw C and then South Carolina. Yeah. I just thought it was Columbia. My bad. Um, but still. It's in Death Valley, baby. Yeah, but still. Running down that end, <laughs> end of the edge of the season. Yeah. You, start, you start pretty much with Georgia. You end with Clemson. Um, and it's still in South Carolina. Gamecock it's not like fans a massive... might still think it's a home game because it's in well, the it's, state. That's the thing. It's, it, that's it's so why close. It's, it's, it's mm-hmm. an in-state rival. So I, I look at this and you know you talk about the hypothetical of you know what if they start mm-hmm. um, you know quick against Georgia it's Georgia I mean they were just they in got a, a really good defense too well, so were, I don't and, expect it to happen and they were in a national championship game mm-hmm. and they've, they've faced adversity before Kirby Smart, Smart is a great mm-hmm. coach I don't think that's going to rattle Georgia I don't think it's going to you know take them off their knocks do I think South Carolina can pull, pull off an mm-hmm. upset yeah. You're bringing Jake Fromm into Columbia. If he's not right with his wide receivers, if he's not ready, and, you know, it, it, he did go up against, uh, you know, uh, an Alabama team in, in the national championship game mm-hmm. and looked fairly decent. But, you know, quarterbacks have bad days. And if this is one of his bad days, South Carolina can pull off pull well, off that upset. And the thing with the, just to, don't mean to cut you off, but with the McClendon comment is not necessarily knocking Georgia back and being like, whoa, what's going on here? But more importantly, if you want to beat a team like Georgia, if you want to beat a team like Florida, some of these, well, what we think would be top-tier teams, really to me, maybe Clemson and Georgia defensively are going to be the two best defensive teams that South Carolina plays, I kind of feel like you want to have that attack that like attack dog mentality of like, we're going to be on the aggressive front, we're going to attack you, we're not going to sit back and wait and melt clock. We're going to attack you every second we get to try to tire you out and knock at that defense and then find our little spots by keeping up tempo to score some points. Yeah, I, I think it's something that it's going to take 
time for the South Carolina offense to adjust to. But if they're able to adjust to it during the offseason, mm-hmm. then, yeah. I mean, if you're going up against Georgia that's not expecting this, that only saw it against Coastal Carolina, mm-hmm. um, it, it could be something where maybe they even hold back a little bit against Coastal Carolina because they know they can beat Coastal Carolina. Yeah. They can win it with their defense. And especially if they start off quick and that defense you know, really starts to pull away and it becomes a, big of a, a bit of a blowout, then they start to slow it down a bit. That could be something where Georgia hasn't seen the full power of this offense. It, it, it could be something that they can use as a disguise. And you're bringing back a, 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 a solid quarterback. I mean, Jake Bentley, he's now in his third year. Mm-hmm. He's a guy that had a really great season last year. 18 touchdowns, 12 interceptions, completed a ton of passes, 62% on the year, near 3,000 yards. I love that from, from a sophomore quarterback. You know, he's just going to get better. He's going to be a guy that possibly puts himself into uh, NFL you know, talks, draft talks, 6'4", 224 body, can complete some passes. If he's able to have a really decent year, 25 touchdowns, and you know, keep that interception number around 12, he can mm-hmm. be a guy that puts himself in, into some some really um, you know high-quality names and, and possibly put himself into the top three rounds of the NFL draft. So this is a team that if – Jake Bentley is able to fit into this offense. They already have a very veteran play caller that has talent. So it's going to be something where, again, if they're able to adjust to that during the summer, Mm -hmm. and especially trusting McClellan because he's been in camp, it's going to be something, again, where South Carolina can possibly pull off some upsets against Clemson, against Georgia, and maybe put themselves near the top of the SEC East. And it's weird. For most of this podcast, I've been saying, oh, biggest question, offensive side of the ball. This is one of the first team's biggest question for me defensive side of the ball. Yeah, they have third-year coordinator, um, Tavares Robinson back, which that's not the question. The question for me is Robinson, who is a guy that will be in talks for head coaching positions at the end of the year, sooner rather than later will be a future head coach in college football. It's just going to happen. But he had to replace a lot of guys, especially up the middle, and then they also have guys like the safety position, that secondary, which could be a little bit of a work in progress this season. So for me, that's my question mark. Will the offense be, and this is kind of the double-edged sword, if you're going to be up-tempo trying to get more at-bats, if you keep scoring and it's like, oh, we scored in, let's say, two minutes. Oh, we scored in a minute and a half. Is that then going to hurt this defense Because it's like, great, we had to try to find guys. We probably don't have the most depth. And now our defense is getting tired because they're out on the field more. However, it's a little yin and yang because I'd rather be out on the field with a Mm -hmm. 21-point lead than out on the field a lot with a 21-point deficit. We're talking about a team that, again, has a coach in place. This Mm -hmm. isn't an SEC East team that's a revolving door of coaches. Will Muschamp's been there for three years. Mm -hmm. And if Will Muschamp has proven anything in his coaching career is that he can put out a good defense. Mm -hmm. I mean, even though he wasn't successful at Florida, he put out a good defense. Mm -hmm. He got a head coaching job because he could put out a good defense. Yeah, they might not be depth, you know, full full of depth, but Mm -hmm. they have talent and they have a good head coach and they have a good defensive coordinator. I'm not really worried about this defense. Yeah, if in Injuries come about like they usually do in in, in football seasons. It's going to be a blow to the Gamecocks. But if they're able to keep their stars out on the field, I think Muschamp will do enough and make sure those deficiencies on defense are mm-hmm. hidden while really making those um, additions, those those positives shine on that defense. So I'm not really worried uh, about that that defense. I'm worried about the offense just because how will they adjust to the, the the pace of play. But I see South Carolina at worst if they're not able to adjust as probably the third best team in, in the SEC East. And if they have a great season, maybe even number one. If, mm-hmm. if they're able to knock off Georgia and they both finish with one loss, mm-hmm. well, they have a tiebreaker uh, against Georgia. So yeah. I, I think that's going to be the biggest thing is, is, is how how well are you going to play against Clemson? Mm-hmm. How well are you going to play against South Carolina? Because you'd be favored in every other game pretty much. It's just you're not going to be favored in those two games. And you got to come out, and I think you got to have strong showings in both of them. They can be a team that sticks around the top 25 for for a while um, throughout this season, especially after that Georgia game. If they're able to pick up a couple wins, like five or six wins after that Georgia game, mm-hmm. this could be a team that maybe hits the top 15. It's funny because most of this podcast, before we got into Carolina, I was like, oh, I'm probably going to be a little bit lower on Carolina. But after looking at it, I'm not going to be that low on Carolina. Mm-hmm. Like, this is a schedule and this is a team that I look at. For me, two for sure losses in my mind. Could change my mind. Not saying that the real world is going to be what I say. You're. I don't think they beat Georgia. I don't think they beat Clemson because for me, Georgia's a all around great team. Kirby Smart's built that team 
and their national championship caliber. I'd be surprised if that team isn't in the playoff hunt end of the year. Then with Clemson, yeah, I don't know quarterback-wise if they're going to have a Deshaun Watson-level guy back behind center. However, this defense, I cannot wait to talk about them. They are going to be stacked. Todd McShay came out with his first way-too-early mock draft, like right after the NFL draft. Most of the guys in that first round, Clemson and Ohio State defensive Mm -hmm. players. Like, this team is stacked defensively. And plus to me, because of that and in the coaching side, I'm giving the coaching um, to Dabo. To Dabo, because Dabo to me is the better head coach when it comes to him and Will Muschamp. To me, there's a th- only three games that I could see losses, and that third one's a question mark because I could see South Carolina winning it. The only reason I put it as a question mark is it's in the swamp is Florida. Mm-hmm. And to me, that could be it. Though At the most, those three losses. If you go more than that, it's because a team like Texas A&M or a team like Tennessee or a team like Kentucky surprised you, where you were the favorite, but they just – Surprised you in the end, or they got a last-second field goal kick and got the upset on you. But for me, an absolutely like dive bomb season this year for the Gamecocks: four losses. The best year you're looking at: two wins. However, if you exceed my two losses, two losses. Your expectations, though, if you exceed mine, one loss at the least. However, I'm going two in mind. I'll probably say I'll probably end on two losses, but I, I think best scenario is you, you end up with one loss, whether that's to Georgia mm-hmm. or whether it's an upset. But I, I think this team isn't going to go undefeated in the SEC East. Could you East, imagine but if they beat Georgia, win the tiebreaker, and play in Alabama or in Auburn in the SEC title game? It'd be game? fun, man. Especially if that's Georgia's only loss. Uh-huh. Could you imagine that? Like Then then it's like, and, and, if, and if South Carolina loses in the SEC championship game, could you imagine what that would do if Georgia going mm-hmm. back in? We'll talk about Georgia in a little bit, but again, yeah. Georgia, you know, being the runners up, mm-hmm. losing one game early in the season, what would that do? Especially because you didn't win your your conference. Mm-hmm. It'd be interesting to see. No, what is even more impre- like more not impressive, but interesting is last week when Brandon and I looked at the other side, mm-hmm. I mentioned with Alabama and Auburn that I could see with those two teams a. Auburn wins the Iron Bowl or Alabama wins the Iron Bowl, and that's the only loss for the other team. So that it's, all right, that's our only loss. You then won the SEC. You're the one seed. I'm the four seed. Let's go round two. Mm -hmm. And if that team that you beat, let's say Auburn wins the Iron Bowl, then Alabama one loss, Auburn no losses, then Auburn plays South Carolina and beats them, that could be a situation that then sets up the SEC to have another two teams in their conference yet again. Um, but before we move on, like you said, we haven't talked about Georgia yet. They're the last team we'll get to. Any final thoughts about the Gamecocks and Will, Will, uh, Will Muschamp's boys? Not really. I, th- I think this is this is just something that, again, Muschamp is probably a season where he probably needs to define whether mm-hmm. he's going to be uh, one of those you know great coaches or if he's just going to be a me- mediocre coach. Because again, he's he's been able to get wins, but he's mm-hmm. never been able to get to those big name bowls. Um, so I think he's he's a thing where you know this is probably a, a, a possible career defining season because you have the quarterback in place, you have the offense in place. Mm-hmm. The defense isn't great, but you're known as a defensive coach. So I think that's the the one thing is if 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 Muschamp has a great season, it's going to really define his legacy. His best year. When it came to um, either at Florida or SC was in 2012, where his team only lost two games. They lost to number 12 Georgia. Georgia. Um, this was when Florida was the third ranked team in the country, and then they lost their bowl game in the Sugar Bowl when they were fourth ranked. They're losing at two ranked 22 Louisville. So that's the best season he's ever had is an 11-2 and two year, could probably, if everything goes right, have a similar season like that with South Carolina this year. But this is where you guys come in. Let us know what you think down below in that comment section. Too high on the Gamecocks. Are we, I don't want to say we're too low. We didn't have them below four losses. Basically, mm-hmm. are we too high on the Gamecocks? What do you think of their new offensive philosophy they're going to put in place? And how many wins and losses would you have for them in 2018? Let us know what you think down below in that comment section. But Sean, let's go into the last team and we're saving the best for last. The runners up 
from last year in the national championship. They were tees close from being the national championships, and that is the Georgia Bulldogs. First question I want to ask you about them is probably over or over seated or exceeded mm-hmm. expectations last year. Does this team take a step back this year? Are they a team that not necessarily doesn't get back to the national championship game because making it back to back national championship games would be impressive? But is this could this be a Georgia Bulldog team that doesn't make the playoffs in 2018? Could the, yeah, I think this could be a team that doesn't make the playoffs again. I mean, they over succeeded um, expectations, like you mentioned, having a freshman quarterback mm-hmm. like Jake Fromm. And then also, you're losing Roquan Smith, you're losing Nick Chubb, Sony Michelle, you're losing some important players on this this team that made it to the national championship. Could I see them not making the national championship and not making the playoffs? For sure. It's tough to be top four team back to back years in, in college football. But will this be a team that is in the race, in the running, in the top 10? For sure, this is a, this is a team that with a ton of talent, with a great head coach, um, that has a fairly easy schedule. That outside of a couple games, they should be favored by ten points. So this is a team that I think with Jake Fromm, who was a freshman, now has another year under his belt and performed fantastically. Twenty one touchdowns, five interceptions, over two thousand yards. This could be a team that that really makes some noise again for the second time um, in the NCAA. And this is a team that I think, like, out of all the previews, this is going to be our easiest one yeah. for this side because— Well, it's really how good will well, they be? It's Yeah, you mentioned, like, oh, they lose Roquan Smith, oh, they lose Sonny Michelle, oh, they lose Nick Chubb. But they'll, they'll have guys to fill up, especially on the defensive side. For me, out of those guys, the question is, is DeAndre Swift and freshman Zamir White, are they going to be able to fill the shoes of Nick Chubb and Sonny Michelle? Those are some big shoes. To me, though, the big question, I look at the schedule. Last year, they only had one loss before that national championship game, and I'll count it. They only had two losses all year. Those two losses to the Auburn Tigers and to the Alabama Crimson Tide. Now, Auburn, they got to re- they got to get the revenge yep. on Auburn in the SEC title game, beating them 28-7. to To me, the only game I could see them losing yet again this year is Auburn. However, to me, that is the most crucial game of the year because I am going to throw a hypothetical at your direction, Sean. All right, do it. Last week, I told Brandon that my prediction, just to be fun with the SEC, is going to be that, I'll put it this way, Alabama beats Auburn in the Iron Ball. No, scratch that. Okay. Auburn beats Alabama in the Iron Ball. All right. Auburn beats Georgia in the regular season. Georgia beats Auburn in the SEC title game. You have an Auburn team. You have an Alabama team. You have a Georgia team all with one loss. The committee is set on fire. We're going home. We're not having a playoff this year. Because what do you do? You put all three of them in? That is No, the you just put Alabama in because that's what they would do. That's the kind of situation, though, that we could be in where it's like Georgia, that was kind of the Auburn, situation we were in last Georgia, year. Georgia, Auburn, and, well, yeah, Auburn was the only one that had two losses. Those three teams could only have one loss again. Like, for Georgia, they need to beat Auburn in the regular season, and they need to win the SEC well, title for me to get to the playoff because if a one-loss Alabama team could make the playoff last year. I'm not going to bank that, yeah, we could be the same. I'm going to say we need to maybe get out of this maybe, and I know coaches aren't going to think about this. I'm going to think about this. We need to get out of that. We need to go well, undefeated so it's an unsure, like unforsure doubt that we're in the playoffs. If Georgia goes no undefeated doubt. and it's a close loss to mm-hmm. Auburn or Alabama in the SEC championship mm-hmm. game, they're in. If one of these teams finishes with one loss, mm-hmm. they're in no matter what. Um, what if three of them did, though? Do three of them get in? That would be insane. I don't think that happens. Um, we just have an SEC playoff. <laughs> <laughs> an SEC playoff. Game. Yeah. <laughs> I, I, I mean, it's, it's a crazy hypothetical. Um, but And I think Georgia probably has the best shot of doing it mm-hmm. because, yes, Auburn's on the schedule. 
but it's at home. So yep. that's going to be the biggest thing. Um, and then also you look at the other game that they could possibly lose, and I think that's South Carolina, mm-hmm. um, just to start off the season if Georgia's caught napping. But outside of that, I think it's a very easy road for them mm-hmm. um, to get back to that, 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 that um, you know, that, that playoff. Um, it's just really... I think it would come down to how bad did you beat them? So how bad did Georgia beat Auburn at home? Then how bad did Alabama beat Auburn um, or uh, Auburn mm-hmm. beat Alabama? And then how bad did Alabama beat Georgia? I think it would come down to that. I think we we probably see two teams again in from the SEC get to the uh, the, the the playoff. It's just really the, the question of which one. And I think Georgia probably has the best odds. Mm-hmm. Um, weirdly enough, because you know I think they beat Auburn at home, and then you just need to really go to that SEC title game and beat Alabama and get revenge, and they're going to be fired up to make sure they get that revenge of the mm-hmm. national title game, um, or you're going to go up against Auburn again where you have that confidence yeah. um, to, to, to beat them. So it, it's going to be something that's interesting, but I think Georgia probably does have the best shot to get back to the playoffs out, outside of those uh, those three SEC teams. And one thing that we did not mention in our South Carolina preview that I'm going to mention right now, mm-hmm. you know what makes that game against the Gamecocks even a little bit more interesting for Georgia is so that game's going to be on the road in South Carolina. Yep. Last year, I'll take you in the way back machine. They play a little Appalachian state team, easy team, beat them 31 to 10. Then in their second game, they take a road trip to South Bend. That was a grueling game. They only beat them by one point. Yeah, it sucked. So, I mean, well, for you, (laughs) because Notre Dame fan, it sucked. But, I mean, we saw that story last year. It was also a monsoon. It was also a monsoon, but, like, we saw that story last year. Kirby Smart, I know, coming out of week one, is going to be reminding his guys, like, hey, we can't be napping. We were almost caught napping last year. But they weren't. But, they weren't the same high yeah. level team last year. That was year. also early on in the season. No some, one expected a ton from Georgia. Some would say that that team or that game might have turned it because after that yeah. it was forty two fourteen, thirty one three, forty one nothing, forty five fourteen. And Fromm was just getting used to being yeah. quarterback. He wasn't bad in his mm-hmm. first two games, but he was just getting again used to playing. But that was probably the game that snapped it, and then they just blew out everyone mm-hmm. except for their two losses to Auburn and. Alabama. I'm not going to yep. say the Oklahoma one was a blowout because it was in double overtime. Yeah, and, and it wasn't a blowout. I mean, they only won by, yeah. what, six points? 54 to um, 48. So, again, I think it's something where you look at this team and they're they're kind of settled in. I mean, it, it's it's something where, you know, they they have a very similar schedule from last year. They have Austin mm-hmm. Peay at home, and then they go away to South Carolina. They got a good team, and then they play another a cupcake. So I, I think that Georgia, again, is set up, like I said, to be the team that goes and represents mm-hmm. the SEC in the playoff, because there's going to be one team that gets there, and especially having that loss to Auburn mm-hmm. in, in the uh, in the in the regular season, um, and especially at Auburn, that's going to play into that that game um, in, in October. And then if you go to the SEC championship game, you want another win over. Alabama, you want mm-hmm. to be able to knock them in the mouth, especially after that overtime loss. You have a freshman quarterback, twenty six to twenty three, and they put their uh, you know freshman quarterback in, and you were up at halftime. Not half just time. that, that guy thought about transferring yeah, before that game. That was we were up at halftime. That was like your game to win. Mm-hmm. I, I think Kirby Smart's going to get us guys fired up. Now it's just really can they be level headed in every single game? Can mm-hmm. they be level headed against South Carolina? Can they be level headed against Auburn? Mm-hmm. Can they make sure they stay on focus? And I think Kirby Smart will be able to do that. So I, I look at this this Georgia team. I know we haven't really talked about too much mm-hmm. about their players, but well, there's, no, there's not too much to say because you lost eight of the you know eight of the players on defense mm-hmm. um from last year, but also I trust their depth. They well, have a, they, they, they 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 know how to scout. Let me ask you this. You say we haven't talked about the players, I'll ask you about one. Jake Fromm. Mm-hmm. Is is he gonna have I'll We'll play this game. Better, same, or worse season this year? Better. How much better? Uh, I think he throws more interceptions, but I think he throws for more yards. Um, I think he probably throws for about 25 touchdowns. He threw five touchdowns last year, so maybe 10, t- 10 interceptions and probably like 2,600 yards. Yeah, he had he 21 really, touchdowns last year. I think he has a really good year. I think, mm-hmm. I think again, he was limited because he was a freshman quarterback. Mm-hmm. He was limited because he had fucking Sony Michelle and Nick Chubb as mm-hmm. his backs. Won't have those so this year. So I think he's going to see more of uh, more of a usage mm-hmm. increase, and I think I think he's really going to ball out because he, he didn't show me anything where he said, all right, that, that's a bad quarterback. He showed me, all right, this kid's going to be a starting NFL quarterback 
in a couple of years. Even though he's six one, he's going to be an NFL quarterback when that time comes in the next three years or in the next four years. He's a guy that I really like. Um, he's not a typical SEC quarterback. I think this kid's something special, and that's the reason why you got rid of Jacob Eason because mm-hmm. this guy is. Again, and not get rid of J- Jacob Beeson, but this is why Jacob Beeson now had to transfer because he wasn't mm-hmm. getting the starting job away from Fromm because this kid's talented. Yeah, and the one thing I want to ask you is this isn't going to be a will he take the job from Fromm because that question is no. But will he be used this season at all? Because the big question is um, Fromm's going to be the starter, but they've got a guy on this roster who's a true freshman, Justin Fields. Mm-hmm. He's a guy that I watched. I remember watching his – announcement video oh, okay. um like his announcement video and i'm like oh he's gonna pick ella like he's he's gonna pick lsu or um this team and then he's like i'm gonna go to the dogs and my first thought was you're a quarterback you do know jake Fromm's there, mm-hmm. right like that was my first thought you do know you're not starting for at least two maybe three years and the thing that it says here i'll read you what um, this preview I'm looking at says where it says true freshman Justin Fields was a five star recruit who enrolled early and gives Georgia a great dual threat option. The kind smart has hungered for since seeing Clemson's Deshaun Watson carve up his defense at Alabama. Is there a chance whether the smallest they give Fields some packages to use his dual threat ability and not necessarily make it a mm-hmm. true two quarterback situation, but in some situations, go all right. We're going to bring Fromm off. We're going to put Fields in to have a small package for Fields to help this offense to give it a different look at times. I think so. I, I think that he can he, he can definitely get some some cuts in. I think I think he's going to be a guy that, that definitely is used in packages because again, you know, if you have a guy that's this talented. You're going to need to use him in different mm-hmm. ways. And, and you know, it's not going to be something where he's going to be used for a whole quarter. He's yeah. not going to be used for a whole half. But, but you don't want it to be like every time he's in, oh, it's going to be a run. It's going to be a run, yeah, guys. Load the box. I think it's something where you could use him in goal line situations. Mm-hmm. I mean, we saw that uh, back in Texas where they had the 18-wheeler, um, you know, uh, you know, whole deal. I, obviously, a different player. Yeah. Um, but I, I think that he's definitely going to be used, especially like, you know, hey, if the running game's not getting going, Let's throw them in there. Let's mm-hmm. see if we can get some read options, try to bust a big play. If they're backed up in their own zone, maybe they, you know, be like, hey, well, let's bring in the, the freshman and just have a guy, you know, let's make them think we're going to run, have mm-hmm. them run a, 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 a you know, a, a, a fly route in the, on, the, on the outside and try to beat the defense. Like, I think he's going to be used in different packages. I don't think he's going to be used that much. I think Fromm's clearly going to be the, the starter and probably mm-hmm. take 80%, maybe 85% of the snaps this year. But I think Fields is going to get some work. And I was going to ask you about the defense because I'm looking at the defense. But the thing that kind of maddens me about the defense is, yeah, you can say their biggest question is their secondary. But I kind of hated, like, I'm thinking in my mind, man, it kind of stinks for, like, a preview that we're sitting here going, ah, they lost all these players. Ah, they'll be fine. And then not mention anything. Like, do you have not necessarily a worry, but... Could this defense take a minor step back this year because they lost so much? They lost eight guys who started on this defense, and all of them, all four of them, at the linebacker position. Mm -hmm. Yeah, they've got guys to fill up, but will they take a – will they? same thing with Fromm. Better, same, worse than last year for the defense. Oh, for the defense, worse. I mean, that's just because they lost mm-hmm. massive playmakers. I mean, you lose Rokot Smith. You lose, uh, who's the other guy that they, the edge rusher? Lorenzo Carter. Yeah, you lose Lorenzo Carter. You lose uh, good old, good old uh, Roquan Smith. You're not going to have that leader mm-hmm. that you did in Roquan Smith. Do I think they're going to be much worse? No, I think they're still going to be a, a top mm-hmm. defense in, in, in the NCAA. Um, but I think they're going to be worse just because you're you're losing the guy in the middle. You're losing mm-hmm. Roquan Smith. He is, I know there's 11 guys in the field, but he was the guy in the defense that you looked at consistently. He was a guy consistently making plays, running back and forth around. And this is why he was a top 10 pick, because of his abilities on the field, but also because he was a good leader. I think not having that player is going to be, is going to at least damper this Georgia defense. I still think they're going to be a damn good Mm -hmm. football team and win some games. Well, and that's going to be, to me, the only, the only hiccup that this team has and what will be the ultimate answer for how well they do this year. Because let's be honest, they're, like me and you have said in this podcast, I think already, they're the favorites to win the East. They might mm-hmm. even be like, unless it's Alabama, they could be in some minds the favorite to win the SEC again. 
Um, that might be more of a toss-up because, yet again, Auburn and Alabama are no joke, and those are who we're assuming um, or favoriting to win the west side of the ball. But I just I feel like if this defense stumbles out of the gate and a team like South Carolina gets them and pops them in the mouth and wins a game, that could be a game, that could be a thing that we look back and it's like, man, this – this Georgia team, man, they finished the year good. Yeah, they did. Oh, man. They're like, man, that, that Auburn game was good. Too bad they lost it again. Oh, man. Could you imagine what happened if they didn't lose that South Carolina game? Man, probably would have played, would have been a playoff team. Like, the defense to me is the biggest question, and that needs to. It's only of a how fast do they get on page to where they were last year or mm-hmm. to where a team like South Carolina doesn't shock them week two of the well, year. Well, I think South Carolina is a good enough football team to give them some yeah. hell. I think but you know, I would Georgia's going to be favored. But. but if South Carolina won that game, it would send shockwaves throughout college football. For sure. Too. But, I mean, that's for with any upset. Yeah. So, I, Especially I, I of a think, team that's the runner-up and yeah. so dominant. I think Georgia is going to be a team that, again, like I said earlier, should mm-hmm. be favored in every single game they play by 10. And mm-hmm. even in that Auburn game, should be favored probably by 7. That South Carolina game, maybe even by like nine or do maybe you, even ten. Do you think when we get our because I've got to look into it when we get our first preseason rankings, do you think Alabama and Georgia are one two? I don't think I don't, I don't see any other team really jump in Georgia for that two spot. Maybe a Clemson if the mm-hmm. voters like I mean, them more. Clemson or Ohio State maybe, mm-hmm. but Georgia. I I see Georgia being a top three team, Alabama mm-hmm. one, um, maybe Clemson, but again, Georgia still has Kirby Smart. They still have Jake Fromm. Mm-hmm. They still have a pretty damn good defense, even though they lost eight of their starters. So I think they give the respect to Georgia. I think Georgia ends up at two. I'm going to say my top five, because we're done with the SEC, my top five, Alabama, Georgia, Clemson, Ohio State, and either Oklahoma or Auburn. I'll, one will be five, one will be six. I'll say mine's the same thing, but put Oklahoma at five. Okay. Let us know what you guys think down below about Georgia. What are they going to do this year? How fast is that defense going to load? Are they going to go back to the college football playoff? Could they be a national championship game participant yet again this year? want to thank you guys well, for checking out the podcast. Go ahead. I don't want to give you an update because this means okay. nothing to college football, but it means something college to college basketball. basketball. Uh, final in the uh, F uh, in the FIBA uh, U, U, U18 uh, mm-hmm. Americans game. Uh, U.S. men's team wins 118-26 to over Panama. Wow. Yeah. Wow. And I, I told you, uh, I think his first name is Ayo, um, one mm-hmm. of the big guys on that team, hoping, knocking on wood, that he does uh, some great things for my Illini this year. But a little housekeeping here at the end of the podcast for you guys. Number one, if you want to be like Matt, which thanks to Matt again, it was a long time ago, um, but he was on this podcast at the beginning. If you want to be like Matt and join us for a podcast, make sure to check out patreon.com backslash most podcast where you can help support MVP each and every month. Also make sure to check out our store either in the link in the description or check out most podcast.com where you can catch it. Make sure to get yourself an MVP t-shirt. Also most podcast.com is where you can catch MVP each and every day. And last but not least, if you're on Apple podcast, you have iTunes have either or, Make sure to go give the Primetime Podcast a five-star rating, then type a little something about why other people should check out the podcast and why you like it so much. It would really mean the world to us. I want to thank you guys for listening to the podcast, whether it's on YouTube watching it or listening on podcast services around the world. We will be back next week where we will be doing the Big 12 in football, just trugging through our college previews. But as always, have a good day, everybody.